So my, my name is Sam Crow, and <clears throat> well, I've been many things in my life because of all, but the most recent interesting things are that I was one of the, I was the first executive director of uh, Claire and Eric, and I'm now senior advisor to Claire and Eric. That's how I spend my life. I'm also being a grand fellow, fellow, so I can divide my attention between many different things. My home base is Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Um, now, this uh, Twin Talks workshop is the fourth in a series. We started in 2019, and then we had two in 2020, and uh, this time we have our fourth. I think in the beginning, the focus of these Twin Talks workshops was very much on the, the digital divide between, let's say, the humanities scholars on the one hand and the, the technical people, computer scientists on the other, because we felt that there was a very wide gap needed to be bridged. And uh, so our last three workshops were very much focusing on that problem. And now for this round, we have added a new problem area because the, the pandemic has taught us that uh, there are other barriers that are in the way for collaboration between people. Even if they are working on the same side of the digital divide, they, there are lots of practical problems in uh, getting in touch, talking to each other for a while, was even for me at least to go to my institute and talk to my colleagues. It must have been the same for many of you in your own country. And <clears throat> uh, there's also the very interesting side with uh, teaching, remote teaching, because that's, that's become very fashionable over the last uh, few pandemic years. And all these things have, I think, should, because let me put it differently. Uh, many people say, well, there, was, there were lots of problems and now we were very happy that they're over. But they were not just problems. They also gave us new insights insights in the way we could collaborate, in, insights in the way we could teach. So I think apart from problems that we had to solve, we've also learned new things that we can benefit from in the future even without any constraints by a pandemic. Now, so this is the, the background of this workshop. And uh, now I would like to introduce uh, Mathieu, well, he, he's actually already introduced himself, but I will just summarize what we have dug up in the archive about him. He is the director of the Institute of Polish Language, so the Academy, Polish Academy, so that we can conform for. And he's also associate professor at the Pedagogical University in Krakow. And, um, and maybe many more. And his research interests are made mostly computer assisted text analysis, quantitative linguistics, machine learning. And his recent works are focused on computational stylistics or stylometry. Actually, when I read this whole thing, and I also read your whole page, I found it very hard to identify things that you've not done. <laughs> You're almost covering the whole universe. So I'm very much uh, looking forward to your presentation. So I, learn, I hope to learn lots of new things from you. And please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for this introduction. Thank you for having me here. That's, that's a big... Uh, honor to me uh, for me to be here, and um, I um, I would try to introduce you to, to the project CLS Sinfa Computational Literary Studies Infrastructure, which is yet another infrastructural project, but its angle, its 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 scope is sl slightly different, somewhat different. Uh, in uh, compared to both Claria, Clarin and, and Daria. So it, it falls somewhere in between. Um, but I will put some stress on how we how we went through COVID, what we've learned. And um, the thing being that the CLS Infra project proposal had been um, the, submitted just before COVID, like weeks before COVID. And then we had to readapt to the new reality very quick. And um, um, for example, I haven't met all of the um, of the project members in person yet, right? And that that's that's you know that comes true for for quite a number of people in our project. There is no one that would know uh, everyone else. So that's 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 an situation we had to uh, cope with that. And um, and I would be very happy to um, to tell more about the lessons we've learned. But before we go any further, a few words about uh, what the CLS Intro Computational uh, Literary Studies is about. So what is this Computational Literary Studies um, about? Um, I mean, it's, it's quite quite, quite self-explanatory. The name says that it's about doing literature uh, by means of computational techniques. It's a broad, uh, it's a rather broad term. So um, 
in most applications, in most cases, this is about doing this analysis in scale, like hundreds of, of books or hundreds of thousands of poems at a time, like big uh, amounts of, of literary data, which doesn't necessarily mean big data as, as it is, because, you know, the, the scale of the literary corpora is, of course, a, a couple, a, a few orders of magnitude smaller than the real big data. Uh, big data challenges, but still, that's that's the corpora that uh, we that we could not even dream about a couple of years ago. So it's about computational um, analysis of uh, computational um, uh, computational analysis of textual data, um, broadly broadly speaking. Now, if um, we want to go back and to ask a question. Uh, about this kind of discipline or this field, um, how old is that? It, it's quite old, I would say. Um, in my in my own thinking of the beginnings of this of this um, computational approach to literature, I would probably point this uh, Leon Battista Alberti person, um, an Italian humanist uh, from the 15th century or 16th century, 15th century, who um, wrote an, um, wrote a treatise on ciphers on different ciphers, how to encrypt, decrypt messages. And in one of the chapters of this manuscript, he covered uh, something like the... Um... Hello, and thank you for choosing the meeting owl. Yeah, so this Leon, uh, Leon Battista Alberti, who wrote the treaties on the ciphers, and one of the chapters was about the uh, color of vowels. When he uh, kind of counted poetry versus prose in order to determine if the uh, vowels are used differently in those two uh, subgenres or genres. And uh, he found out that the vowel E is like better, sounds better for poetry as opposed to an A or A, which sounds better for prose. This kind of, this kind of um, the findings he had, which are um, not very solid if we uh, try to replicate it nowadays, but still that was the beginning of thinking of let's do, uh, let's do some computational analysis. Let's do some, um, some statistical analysis of literary sources, right? So that's that's to, to, to at least uh, to my view that's the beginning of this of this literary uh, literary computational uh, thinking in um, assessing literature. Now, if we really think of a seminal book that that was foundational for that for that field, uh, one single book. If I had to name one book, just one book um, of that kind, it would be definitely John Barrows's uh, Computation into Criticism, a study from 1987 um, on Jane Austen's novels. And in this study, uh, John Barrows, what he did, he made the, the um, following assumption. Take the most subjective um, discipline ever. That's probably that's probably literary criticism. Right? The quality of your uh, outcomes uh, depend on how bright you are, how 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 witty you are, how good an interpreter you are. Right? It, it depends on the uh, on the scholar um, him or herself. Whereas he um, he assumed, what if we add some exact methodology into this very, very, um, very blurry, uh, if I may say so, or not very objective field um, as um, literary criticism. Will we or would we learn something new about literature? What he did, he uh, took the novels of Jane Austen's and uh, he counted the words in order to find some uh, patterns. What I mean by patterns, for example, he took apart or he um, extracted the words from a particular novels um, spoken by particular characters, right? by Emma, by, by Jane, by whoever, right? Uh, Bennett, you name them. He extracted those words, uh, those utterances, 
And then he found out that there is a distinction between the language that Jane Austen introduces to distinguish uh, lower class, middle class, and upper class characters, to distinguish female voices from male voices. Uh, and he basically discovered that Jane Austen was good enough as a writer to just distinguish the voices, to stylistically differentiate particular voices. And this very book has become a foundational, seminal point of reference in all uh, the, um, the following approaches to literature using computational uh, or mathematical techniques. Uh, and then came a bunch of, and another bunch of very seminal and interesting books that shaped that uh, field of CLS or computational literary studies, starting with Franco Moretti and his idea of, of uh, distant reading. Um, contrary to what we think today, Franco Moretti's original thought was to uh, not to look at the books themselves. He assumed that um, in our uh, lives we have will we will never have enough time to read through all the books, um, the target books of interest. So rather we could um, focus on metadata. Right. So that's a very very uh, important step that he did. Let's not look at the text themselves. Let's not even open the books. Let's instead look at the covers of that books. So let's collect the information about uh, the title, the author, the uh, year of publication, the publisher, um, the genre, gender of the author, and so on and so on and so on, right? So let's collect as much, as, as, as many metadata as possible in order to uh, have a broader picture of literature without even opening a single poem or a single novel, right? So no reading or a distant reading was the idea of actually no reading the books, right? But reading the metadata instead. And then uh, his followers, uh, namely Matt Jokers or um, Steve Ramsey, uh, those names, they took this original idea of Franco Moretti's and kind of scaled it up in order to assess not only the metadata, but also the data themselves. So the, the, the books themselves, the, the text, themselves using NLP techniques and you know the things you are you are uh, much better than I am at right so um, the idea of macro analysis of um, of my dockers 2013 was to scale up the uh, the uh, distant reading idea in order to look not only to the metadata he did that as well uh, in one of the chapters but also to look deeper into the text to to, um, to use stylometric methodology to distinguish different styles of the books coming from the originally Irish or American or English background, or to distinguish book written by a uh, female and male author, uh, authors, and so on and so on, right? By using the, um, the, the vocabulary, the words, the, the word distributions. So he did uh, introduce this topic modeling technique. That was not his technique, but still, still he very successfully introduced it to the study of literature to distinguish some latent structure of of um, the different books, right? So that's the addition reading idea linked with, uh, say, NLP. It's, it's a very, very simple NLP. I mean, it's mostly scratching the surface of the, of the word forms rather than going deeper into the NLP uh, technologies. And then the recent book of um, Ted Underwood's uh, Distant Horizons that combines those two, uh, those two approaches. So uh, he, he takes another uh, step forward in order to assess lots of books, lots of novels at a time uh, by having an access to this Hadi Trust um, collection, which is quite substantial. It's, it's like hundreds of thousands of, of books um, on his disposal. So he could, he could uh, do basically um, address the same questions as both uh, Franco Moretti and Matt Jokers did uh, a decade before, now with a much bigger, uh, much bigger, um, uh, much bigger data set. Now, um, CLS or computational literary studies is not only about measuring the properties of the books themselves, of the text themselves, of the language or a style of the texts themselves, but also you can take a different perspective. 
rather than looking at the text, you can look at the how the texts are are, are um, received or percepted, right? So that's an approach that, for example, uh, Karina van Dalen uh is taking. Uh, her book is just out like a week ago about the riddle of literary quality. The question was, what what is the difference between good literature and and, and bad literature, bad literature, uh, literature? And in order to assess that question, she first ran a survey, a big survey, um, a, a large scale survey in the Netherlands first. Uh, asking 27,000 people to rank 401 books, if they read it or not, depending, of course, uh, to rank them how uh, good or, or not good they are, and how literary or not literary they are. And then she contrasted it or she compared it against the textual features themselves. So she used the methodology of um, Ted Underwood's, Matt Jokers's, and uh, other stylometric techniques, using some techniques I, I uh, had developed, by the way, uh, to uh, find out if there's any correlation between um, what we see in the text and what the reader says, <laughs> what the readers think of those books, right? And she found out, for example, the very strong positive correlation between the literariness, the level of literariness, and the um, quality, literary quality. So on this um, very far end of being non-literary and very bad, there were 50 shades of gray, right? And on the other end, I don't remember what it was, like Harry Mulish, something like that, right? So that was, that was the spectrum of, of different, different books. And she had repeated, and she has repeated that uh, in English um, a, a year ago, and now her book uh, in English version is out and she said she would bring a couple of copies here. So just you know, be careful to, not to miss her. Right, so uh, CLS or computational literary studies, this is, this is uh, a weird combination of different things. So literary studies, of course, it is good to have some knowledge about literature, but not only that, there is another field that contributed like a lot to uh, to the to this field, and that's um, the computational linguistics or or, or quantitative linguistics. There's different approaches. I'm just highlighting the book I like particularly particularly much because I, I learned some basics of statistics uh, using that book. But there's plenty of those. It doesn't need to be held by it. So uh, literary um, scholarship or criticism, literary criticisms, uh, criticism combined with uh, computational linguistics or even quantitative linguistics and also NLP technologies right so so there's there's a combination of those of those um, of those approaches including um, the sure thing the um, NLP machinery so um, computer scientists so as such uh, the CLS or computational literary studies this is a combination of those things like the uh, this computation into criticism. So let's do literary criticism with the means of computers, uh, the distance reading, stylometry, which is which is particularly my field, um, and uh, well, digital humanities is also a part of that, right? And so on and so on. I'm not going to, to list all of those uh, subfields, but there's, there's a combination of those uh, many subdisciplines that make uh, the work in literature using math uh, mathematical approaches possible or feasible. So, in thinking what, what we uh, gain, what, what is the added value of CLS, of this computational literary uh, studies over some other approaches to literature or some other approaches to language in, liter in, in literature, uh, to me, this is at least three of those. And that's something I, I like very, very much. This is the scientific method. This, you might call it objectivity, but I, I don't like this word. There's no objectivity to, to, in my view, but something that you can break down into reproducibility of your results. For example, there is, there is, it's quite an, quite an accepted um, habit of putting your code and your data on GitHub or some other reposit repositories to let people reproduce your results if they wish to, right? It's a super cool thing that uh, I've been in this field, I mean, in the digital humanities field for like 15 years, maybe 20, and I, have, I, I, I haven't seen that previously. That's, that's a new thing. Let's put our code and the, and the data set on GitHub. Let's uh, 
make it reproducible. That's a super cool thing. Uh, this empirical um, empirical paradigm of, of observing the things, right? That I, I, I don't have to explain, but the thing is that um, it would be great to use mathematical apparatus and analytical approach to solve our problems, but the life is much more complex and we cannot do uh, the algebra of literature, right? So instead we have to rely on what we observe. And the, 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 the question is, if we observe a phenomenon, does it exist or not, right? And that's where statistics uh, comes into play because statistical methodology can solve this question to which extent this what we see is is probable probably existing or not all right uh, so statistical modeling is that's that's the reason statistical mod modeling is so so fashionable in that in that field and basically inference based on some probabilistic um, well methodology machinery and um, the, and assumptions to start with. So that's one thing, right? This statistical method, this uh, way of, um, of getting some, of acquiring some new knowledge by, um, by means of statistical methodology, if I may say so, or observation combined with statistical methodology. That's one. The second thing is the scale. I mean, back in time, I remember when I was first time in, in this conference, um, the, that was the H conference. No, it was still ACCL slash ACH conference. Very, very obscure acronym. And that was years ago. And I was presenting something like psychometric approach to something I don't remember what it was. And I used a couple of texts. And I was it was quite impressive uh, for everyone in the room. How did you manage to collect those fifteen texts? Right. No. <laughs> Now, if I say I've collected 1,500 texts, I would be, ah, <laughs> who cares, right? Who cares? Right? So this scale is that the CLS has to offer, right? Uh, as a, a literary scholars, we can read through maybe 60 novels, maybe 600 if you're good in reading, but that's that's the limit, right? Um, for us here, we can, we can scale it up, and that's... That's what makes it possible to see more. And um, the, the third thing, which is particularly important in the subfield I, I, I'm active at, uh, which is telemetry and authorship attribution, using statistical methodology, you can see the patterns that are, um, that are not really visible with the naked eye. So by observing the frequencies of the function words, such as D and off, in, over, for, et cetera, you can see some similarities between texts that you simply don't see with the naked eye. And that's, that's another you know, reason for me to, um, to like the CLS uh, approaches or computational literary studies approaches. And uh, to me, to scale it even further, um, it reminds me of the 17th century situation in the exact sciences, in the, in the earth sciences, in the life sciences. I mean, the scientific revolution that we observed in the 17th century, uh, there was this person, Blaise Pascal, or um, the, the philosopher, not only that mathematician, and you know, all, the, all the things he did, and he uh, wrote this uh, micro essays um, called um, The Things or the, the Thoughts, they see. Uh, in one of those, he suggests he takes us on an imaginary um, the journey to the end of the universe. And he says, so now imagine that our Earth, that, that our planet Earth is as small as a, as a grape, but our imagination goes further. So now imagine the solar system to be as small as a ball, but our imagination goes further and further and further, and there's no limit. And you know, he uh, introduced the infinity, the notion of infinity into, into philosophy. That was, that was quite scary for him. And he said, well, that's, that's, that's the, the realization. What is a human being in, compared to that infinity? That's quite scary. Mm -hmm. And now he said, so let's go back to ourselves and let's set off for, um, for a second uh, journey, imaginary journey to the inside of our you know, bodies. Let's now uh, imagine that each uh, blood cell is as big as, as a table, but our imagination goes further and further, right? And it never stops. And he you know, introduces those two infinities. Why am I saying about this to, to, to infinities? This was possible because of the two instruments that were introduced 
that had been introduced around that time, uh, around the beginning of the 17th century, is the telescope and the microscope, right? So the instruments made, you know, uh, or introduced some change also into the thinking, into the philosophical uh, stances of, 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 you know, how we can, how we can proceed with, uh, with, um, and knowing the things better, right? And I'm um, I'm mentioning that because I think we are seeing a very similar phenomenon, uh, similar phenomenon with humanity humanities these days, with this instrument being the computer, and you know those data sets, which are you know, unprecedented. This is orders of magnitude bigger than we had like ten years ago. Uh, let alone 20 or 30 years ago, ago. So nowadays in these years, we can do research on an unprecedented scale because of that, because of the resources, right? Uh, we, uh, by we, I think we rather than you, because you do think about resources because the, you know, that's in the room, the, the infrastructure of people. So you, you understand the importance of the resources, but uh, the stylometry is not so much, not so often, right? the importance of the resources that someone did for us. Uh, so not only resources, but also the tools. I mean, those microscopes and telescopes, right? Like computer programs and, and machines, uh, the computer power that you can run a, uh, you can, for example, train a network um, AI thing for like two weeks or three weeks, and you can afford that. Back in time, it was simply out of reach, right? So so this is, this is all the elements that are, that make the situation, in my view at least, similar to that of uh, Blaise Pascal's 300 years ago, right? The revolution, the scientific revolution that we are now experiencing, is experiencing in, in the humanities. That's, that's how, I, uh, how I see that. And as in the case uh, of the scientific revolution back in time, we uh, struggle or, or we see the same issues, which is, um, Doing research is not possible individually anymore, right? Without the, um, the, an access to the resources, without an access to the infrastructure. And that's a big change that we have already observed in the digital humanities, but not really elsewhere yet in the humanities. So that's why the research infrastructures are so, uh, so important. And now, before I go any further, there's one tiny, not so tiny, uh, science note that I have to make. We in the humanities have had the research infrastructure for uh, infrastructures for centuries. So let's not forget about the infrastructures we had been using for, for, for years, if not centuries. This is this is libraries, right? Library and the circulation of knowledge, um, the circulation of knowledge um, which is secured by publishing houses, uh, journals, and so on and so forth, right? So, so this is the infrastructures we are uh, used to already. However, in this talk and, you know, in this room, because you're infrastructural people, so we understand that very well, uh, it is far more than just a library that we need. Uh, so, you know, infrastructures include, infrastructures in humanities include, that's, you know, one of the examples um, in a dictionary of the 17th century Polish language that we compile at our institute. There's plenty of those, of course, across Europe and elsewhere, uh, without which research on the 17th century, this particular example, would not be very, very simple, right? And that's just one of of many, many examples. Another is Corpora, uh, a beautiful corpus compiled by uh, Christoph Schoch and, and his colleagues um, for the cost action distance reading that has been completed a couple of years ago. Um, the Corpus Eltec, which consists of more than 1,200 novels, so 1,200 novels in more than 10 languages, uh, fully TI XML and fully, fully annotated in terms of um, some layers of annotation. I don't remember exactly uh, what it was, but some of the collections have, um, they have the, um, the part of speech tagging and some other layers of annotation. Some other collections, uh, those under resource have the structural, um, structural, structural annotation uh, only. So it depends on the collection. A beautiful, uh, a beautiful corpus that it's it's just there, right? You can grab it, you can have it. It's it's available. Another so, and this corpus and, and, and other other uh, resources like that 
uh, had or have become the part of the CRS infra um, the project that I'm going to, to uh, cover later. Another beautiful project, another beautiful collection that um, has become a part of the CLS Infra project is the Dracor. A separate project, but it is a, at the same time a part of the CLS Infra um, infrastructural um, universe. That's Dracor. Dracor or uh, drama, Corpus of Drama, Drama Corpus, uh, run uh, in Potsdam by our colleagues from the CLS Infra project, which consists of several collections of drama, um, like 100, uh, more than 100 German drama uh, or tragedies and comedies, 1000 French comedies and tragedies, <coughs> and so on and so on. Uh, Shakespearean corpus, like lots of stuff is there, fully annotated, structurally annotated. You can grab it, you can have it, you can access it via APIs if you're up to that. So that's, that's a beautiful resource that we take advantage as well in the CLS Infra project. So the CLS Infra project is not about building the resources, but just making those resources speak one to another, right? To collect the high quality resources and to make them communicate. So the CLS Infra, or Computational Literary Studies Infrastructure Project, uh, that started uh, more than two years ago, um, so during COVID, but the proposal had been um, submitted before COVID, um, is about, well, I don't know what it's really about. Is it about building an infrastructure or theorizing what an infrastructure should be? A bit of both, right? So it's it's not really super specific in both the uh, proposal and even in the call. What kind of infrastructure uh, the European Commission really asks us to provide? So you, I mean, by you, I mean the Clarin and Daria uh, infrastructures. You know that this notion of infrastructure might be a bit blurry at times, right? We don't. Sometimes we don't really know what we are up to. So um, let me cover um, in a few minutes what we mean by the infrastructure in the CLS infra. Um, so of course, in the hard sciences, we know what the infrastructures are. These are those big toys, right? Like in, in this Hadron Collider in Geneva, something like that, right? In the humanities, we already know what, what the uh, uh, infrastructures are. These are the libraries, right? And the, and the publishing houses. But in the DH uh, realm, the, um, the picture is much more complex. Not only libraries, not only toys we need, but also some theoretical considerations and you know, um, resources, resources that would be able to communicate one with another. There's you no know, plenty of different facets of this infrastructural thinking that should be covered in DH. Um, uh, unlike, you know, just, you know, literary scholarship or uh, unlike the hard sciences, where the notion of infrastructures is, is quite uh, clear cut. So in the CLS Infra project, we divide this thinking of infrastructures into first the collections, text collections, which is corpora, but not only the tons of text, but also the metadata. The metadata that would um, the, that would um, be compliant with a certain certain you know form that could communicate one with another, and also the conversion ideas and conversion tools to make those data sets communicate. Right? We don't want to mess with someone else's corpora. We don't want to tell the drug or people, "Hey, you don't you did it wrong. Please reconsider your TI or something like that." No, that's not the way to go. This is dirt. A beloved baby, right? Let it stay where it is. We want to just make it communicate with other corpora. So this under this text collections, I mean not only collections, but also the uh, means of, of making them communicate one with another and the conversion, conversion, um, conversion ideas from one format to another. So uh, resources, the second being uh, methodology. Methodology, broadly speaking, meaning, you know, the tools, because the NLP people, they've got beautiful tools. I mean, the Clarion tools from, from, from Prague, for example, I mean, the UDPI, and this, this is beautiful, but the literary scholars 
have no idea of their existence. I mean, not, not at all whatsoever, right? So the idea here is to make them aware of what NLP is, how to use NLP, and not only that, to, uh, to build some chains of NLP tools, right? Again, not to mess with the tools themselves. That's, that's what those authors of the tools did. What we want to add is the glue between those elements to make them, uh, to make them speak, uh, to make them speak. And not only the tools, but also this theoretical considerations, some awareness of methodological, uh, again, very simple example. Um, literary scholars, literary scholars, they don't know about the NLP tools, but they also, they are not aware what part of speech tagging is, right? What is the notion of that? What is, why would you need that, right? So we want to make them aware of not only the tools, but also these methodological frameworks, right? These ideas, these notions of where, what the NLP tagging might be, uh, might be, random speech tagging might be useful. And the third part of this infrastructure, to me, actually, most important is the people, is the people or the network of scholars that we want to build, the network of uh, scholars within the project, but also the network of scholars um, being aware of the, the of the methodologies and the resources that we provide, so the network of users, if I may say so, to me again, that's that's a, that's a notion that I, I find very very important to have a um, relatively broad circle of learned uh, or educated um, users rather than doers. Right? I don't expect everyone. I do um, stylometry or auto attribution, but I would love people, I would love to make people aware what this stylometry is about, how to read some outcomes, right? How to, how to get, uh, get in touch with the results, right? So same here, we want to build a network of maybe not collaborators, but, but you know, uh, people to use those technologies. That, that's already a success, I would say. And uh, in order to, to make that possible, we organized training schools. We had two already, uh, one in Prague uh, one year ago, uh, one in Madrid a couple of months ago, and the third is to come um, next year in Vienna, which is next door. All right, so <laughs> sign up for that. It's gonna be about um, the drug or corpus and the ways of, of getting uh, information from that. So the overarching goal is to connect the people, right? The people being the most important part here, the data and tools and the methods into one, well, infrastructure. The notion of infrastructure is a bit blurry, but that's how we define the infrastructure, right? A connection of those different facets and different ways of, uh, of um, communicating with the idea of CLS, of the computational, computational literary, um, literary studies. Uh, yeah, some people like to look at those, you know, work packages. I hate that, but you know, some people love it. So <laughs> to amuse you, to please you, whatever. I know those work packages, number eight, speaking to number one and so on. So we can skip that. There's plenty of people involved in that project, uh, way over 30. And uh, the list is not really updated because again, now we are in entering to this post-COVID situation. I'm not really aware who's really there and who is not anymore because of that COVID situation, right? We are meeting every every month in Zoom. We are meeting uh, within smaller groups um, the, much, much more often, but still I'm not entirely sure who is, who is there, right? <laughs> to some extent. So the activities is the training schools that I've mentioned. I can skip that. And uh, another very important thing, uh, please consider applying, is the short-term um, scholarships for like six to 12 weeks in one of those six uh, places, which is Galway, Potsdam, Terea, Madrid, Vienna, or, or Prague. We uh, have a call twice a year. Please consider applying if you want to do some CLS um, research in one of those six uh, things and get some knowledge, contribute to the CLS crowd, of course, at the same time, right? So these are our, our, our tools to, to make this network of scholars um, um, alive. 
And now there are some deliverables that we uh, already have. I'm not going to list it because I want to uh, I want to focus on on the post COVID situation uh, instead. But there's one deliverable I I, I specifically want to cover uh, the deliverable three point two if you're up to the numbers, which is a survey of methods. Um, something that Patrick will like. Uh, it's kind of a book that you can either read vertically or horizontally, and this is like a general introduction to corpus building, general introduction to pre-processing and annotation, general introduction to data analysis, general uh, uh, introduction to evaluation, and then the same goes for authorship attribution, genre analysis, literary history, uh, gender analysis, and canonicity. All of those have the same structure of you know, collecting the data, annotating, um, then doing the analysis, and then evaluating the results. You can read that vertically, if you if you if you like it right or horizontally if you just want to go through analysis in those different subdomains or the evaluation uh, ideas across the different domains right and uh, you click on those tails and then you then you can enter particular not very big chapters the idea was to keep it to keep it concise with some with some references um, this is an entry entry level point for for new people in the text analysis field. Now, I promised to talk more about the post-COVID that it's going to be just a couple of minutes, but that's the lessons that we've learned. Um, there's a bunch of lessons, but I will start with um, the simplest thing, which is technology. Without the technology, it would have been really, really difficult to manage the project to, to keep it on, on track. So to start with, uh, we, had a, we had a dilemma of either going you, the Clarin people, have no dilemma like that because you've got your Clarin repositories. But we had that. I mean, should we go to, say, GitHub as something maybe proprietary, maybe owned by Microsoft, but it will stay forever? Or should we instead think of something alternative, uh, locally installed? And we did. We, we installed a locally a GitLab instead of GitHub, GitLab repository on the servers of our institute. So the, uh, the data are safe, but no one can guarantee that when my um, the institute collapses one day, the data will be restored. I hope yes, but you know, it's not as sustainable as, as GitHub is, right? But still, uh, we have some, some safety measures in order to then, um, to then set those, those data sets in stone. So we use GitHub or GitLab to be specific, um, the repositories to store our code and to store the corpora, specifically the corpora and the, the tools that we developed um, using the, the Git um, the versioning, uh, of course, that's nothing new for, for the people in the room, of course. But we also took advantage of, the, of this, um, issues that you can uh, open using GitLab, the issues to track the progress of the project, right? So we've got the issue, uh, the training school in Madrid due in um, April 2033, and there are some subtasks to be done, and then you can use those, those, this tool to just check the task, to track the, the uh, progress of the project constant. Right, using this ticketing method. And that's very useful. You can link it to particular actors responsible for that, for that deliverables or tasks. That's very, very useful. Uh, I've discovered by chance, and I'm really happy I have uh, discovered that. Uh, final storage, that's another thing uh, that we're um, considering. Should we go to Google Drive? Mm, maybe not. Should we go to something like Dropbox? Maybe not. So we've picked Nextcloud as again an open source uh, server that we installed locally um, on the server in our institute, and all the um, all the participants of the projects have an access to that, and that's where we stored uh, all the data, including the sensitive. Then the sensitive data that's, of course, password protected uh, two-step two authentication and so on and so on and so on. So we use, we use Nextcloud with, again, the same, um, the same dilemma, right? Should we be local but safe or should we go wild but um, let the data slip out of our hands? Maybe not, right? So that was, that was our thinking here. And there's... Uh, 
I have to stop here because that was a game changer. I mean, one of the colleagues from our, uh, from our team suggested that we don't use email anymore because email is not sustainable. There's like 50 new emails every day. It's a mess. So I, I'm also saying it for myself. Whenever I get you know, a new email, chances are I will just miss it because if it goes out this, the first screen, then it can just get you know, put in the limbo, right? So. I was suggested, we are suggested to use a chatter instead that again, different solutions. There were the many advocates for this Discord, um, the Discord uh, chatter, which is very feature, full of features and really fast and cool. Uh, it drains the battery of, of my laptop very fast though. Uh, so we are using that, but in a different in a different project. And by the way, uh, there is a new uh, server um, uh, run by a colleague uh, of ours who is actually attending the conference here, Artyom Shela, a latent reading, this is actually for distant reading. So latent reading, if you want an inv invitation to that server, uh, just, you know, link twice through. Away from it. Send you a, an invitation. So instead of this Discord, which is full of features, but again, uh, the data stays somewhere uh, we don't know where, we've picked the Mattermost. Mattermost being, well, much smaller solution, but it can it is open source and it can be installed locally. So we, we installed it locally on our servers again, um, and it does not have the the voice um, the communication, uh, the video communication, the conferencing uh, functionalities. But still, it is good enough for the sake of our project. What is cool about this chatter solution? I know that most of you are you know. I've been using this chatter solutions for years, but I'm new to that. For me, it was it was a game changer to have you know uh, it divided into particular channels, each channel uh, about different thing, and then I could I, I still can you know trace the, the the incoming messages. You don't have to use all those dear professor this and that and sincerely yours. You don't have to do that because that's a chatter you know vibe. You just you just post what you what you want to. There's one additional feature. I will I will cover that in a minute, which is those reactions. Right here you've got some reactions that yeah, good. Uh, it's it's great to have it done, uh, which turned out to be one of the another game changer of our project. I mean, this constant uh, feedback from the participants of the project. I mean, this thumbs up or or a, or a heart or whatever. Um, that's during during those difficult uh, years of COVID. That had, that that has been a, a life changer sometimes. I mean, this this interaction with the particular participants of the of the projects. And last but 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 definitely not least, this is a conferencing teleconferencing system. We were using Zoom when before it was cool because when we were working on the proposal uh, before COVID, we were already uh, using Zoom because someone suggested uh, it to us. Now, after the beginning of the project, when the COVID hit, we had to decide, do we want to stay on Zoom or do we again want to choose something like Matamos, Nextcloud? Do we want to go open source? So we tested this Jitsi thing. We tested this blue button thing. And no, <laughs> sorry, but no. I really like those guys that for the efforts to make it almost usable, but we had to, have something really reliable. So that's the exceptions that we did for the teleconferencing system. It is not something installed locally on our servers. This is this is just Zoom, right? Because you know that that was we didn't want to have that compromise. So so Zoom was our uh, our uh, our choice. And now to conclude this talk, I want to summarize all those lessons, all those you know uh, difficult situations that we experienced during COVID. All the um, all the things that we've learned over the, um, the, the those difficult months uh, to summarize it as two good habits or two two observations or two, or, or six lessons something like that that we that we've learned um, just very briefly. So the first one is 
just work in the real time. Don't rely on email that you will go back to like in like three days time. No, this is this chatter. This is the constant, constant um, communication. Uh, I've got this chatter always on in my computer. Also in my in my phone, not all the channels. I just want to to to, to silence down some of the notifications. So you have to keep your life work balance as well, right? So please remember about that. But this constant constant um, working in in real time was was a very very important thing during those difficult months of uh, COVID. Mm. So we also. Sometimes we schedule meetings like five minutes coffee, informal coffee of a Zoom with someone using this chat, right? Do you have five minutes? Yes, I do. So then we then we connect. So this constant, um, I may be, maybe I forgot to say, uh, the CLS in France, 13 countries, 13 or 14 institutions for like seven or eight countries. So that's that's a large, that's a large network. So we need to to have some means of communication. We need to remember, I asked someone, so will you please deliver a talk on this or that day, or will you meet, uh, schedule a meeting on this or that day? No, sorry, I won't because in Ireland we celebrate a bank holiday. So mm -hmm. sorry, but no. Another you know, situation, no, in Germany we have something like, I don't know what, right? And so on and so on. So that's another uh, difficult thing. But work in real time, rule number one, right? Uh, well, rule, rule number two is rather, it's a dream rule rather than reality. Director is visible. I, that's what I've learned that when I'm visible, when the PI is visible, the, uh, it puts some grease on, on, on the project. Uh, otherwise, it might, might stall, right? So uh, director should be visible, but it's also a difficult lesson to me because I myself kind of suffered from this long COVID, right? I, I, I myself had some moments of like, Maybe not desperation, but feeling alone, right? And that's that's the thing I have to say. Great thing about the colleagues from my team that they would nudge me, they would push me, and that's that's again this communication and this constant feedback that turned out to be super super important. So people uh, the, the, all starts with people, and the and all starts with communication. All starts with with uh, with feedback. So the director is visible. That's that's an ideal situation, and I, I wish uh, and I hope we'll be there one day. I'm I'm getting better after this COVID. Number three, you know, again, people forge personal bonds whenever you can. Because as said, I haven't met maybe half of the people involved in the project I did, but the other half I did not. So whenever possible, schedule a coffee or when you meet someone in a situation you didn't expect, like a year uh, ago or two years ago, I was invited for a workshop in Bonn about Neo-Latin Neo -Latin and something. I mean, different combination of words. And here's a colleague from, from, from the team, Ingo Berner from, from Vienna, right? Showing up. Ooh. Never, never met him before, right? That's that's a cool situation. So that's that turned out to be super, super important. Uh, number four, uh, don't rely on just the PI. <laughs> distribute this responsibility. Distribute the the um, the work um, across all the sub sub um, work packages and sub tasks that that's really beneficial for everyone also for those people that are starting their careers they really like to be to, to, to have some burden they really like to be dumped you know some some responsible responsibility so and uh, the thing I, I underestimated at the beginning celebrations Whenever a deliverable comes out, we do celebrate. We have a dedicated slot during our monthly meeting to just go through some slides and to celebrate, to just feel that we've achieved something, to feel that there is a success, right? We also celebrate the success as, as those tiny, tiny thumb, thumbs up uh, on Discord or on Matamos that really makes a difference. Uh, if you asked me that question a couple of years ago, I would say, well, no. It would it would not make a difference, but I changed my mind totally. It does. It totally does. I mean, constant feedback and celebrating small successes. And the number six and the final one. This, of course, there is the management skills that you can acquire. You can 
complete a school on this or that MBA, whatever, right? But our our um, experiences show that this is not a talent. This is just some efforts that you have to make. This is just you know you have to believe that that even mm -hmm. during COVID, even during difficult situations, you can you can. Um, uh, you can pull your project through quite successfully. That was, that was quite important for us, right? That uh, we all, I mean, we, the humankind, experienced the COVID and no one, you know, taught us how to deal with that. And we had to manage, right? So that's, that's, that's all about it. So uh, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, should you have any questions, I'd be happy to head up. Very nice talk, Matthew. No surprise there. And you know, saying that you've um, uh, um, uh, given a nice talk is like saying, oh, I see you're wearing shoes today. <laughs> um, uh, COVID hit us all by surprise and we had to quite kind of scramble. What should we be developing now from the lessons of COVID that we didn't get a chance to in the emergency? Oh, yeah, cool. Uh, from my experience, this is. Um, Money management, for example, we uh, overestimated the or yeah overestimated the amounts of money we would need because you know traveling. So there's a heap of money you don't want to want to spend on, and then uh, inflation hits. Let's say you know second wave, and out of this heap you've got just one third of it, and you don't know where to invest that. Right. So that's that's one of the lessons that we should be careful about where to allocate money, and to should should be careful about. Um, having a grant agreement with, with for example, the uh, European Commission or whatever the grant agency is, that it is kind of flexible, that we can reshuffle some or uh, do some rearrangements uh, within within the budget. Right? The second thing is the risk management thinking. That's, um, as a director of the Institute, I've seen many, many projects that my colleagues are going to submit. They asked me, uh, is it ready? I said, what about the risk management part they say, they, and they say well there's no risks so I'm really glad. <laughs> and wait wait for that because you know three years later or two years later four four years later when they when the project is about to conclude every and single every 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 one you know, comes back and say can can we please extend it by one year mm -hmm. and so what, what's the reason and they say there's plenty of reasons so you should have you know put that all those reasons into your risk management back then, right? So that's the thinking that, that that's a big lesson that um, after all, we all ask for, for, the, um, for the extension and we have to justify, we have to write this half a page justification. So when submitting a project, we just write this half a, year, uh, half a, half a page justification in advance, right? And you put it into the risk management. That, that's the lesson number two, I, I would say. And uh, well, kind of a lesson number three is that uh, we got used to a comfortable life and we forgot the unpredictability of the past centuries. We probably should go back to that, that you know, thinking of unpredictability uh, around us, right? And be ready to some things to happen. That's, that's at least my lesson, right? To be just ready for good things and bad things to happen. Thank you. Solid. Thank you. Thank you very much. This talk was fabulous. It took us all the way through what is computational literary studies, where it came through, the infrastructural aspects, and then the tools that came out of the COVID experience. I wanted to go back to the middle part where you use GitLab and um, Nextcloud for the data. And I just wondered, because you've done it so well during the COVID and you've, you've sort of had to think about where to put this information, I just wondered about sustainability because I think you're about three quarters of the way through the project yep. or something like that. More than I have, yeah. What, what is the next sort of steps? Where, where will these lessons that you learned through COVID think about going forward, like Draco and the uh, yeah. ELT corpus as well. Um, where will they go at sort of like after the- Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's one of the biggest questions ever, right? Uh, the projects come and projects go, but the, the outcomes should stay. And the outcome uh, here is the CLS as a field, right? This computational tree studies 
as a field um, sustained by the technology or whatever we, we develop, right? So uh, this kind of ticketing system, if or when we're done, we're done. We can just close it down and that's, that's it, right? But the code, right? The code of the tools, we're thinking of maybe transferring it to GitHub to this respected uh, repository, maybe. I, I like this GitLab thing, so I will negotiate with my SC. I don't have to negotiate right now, but when we're done, when we're, when we're finished, um, to just keep it forever or as long as possible. Um, same goes for the next cloud, but the next cloud contains mostly the um, the internal projects um, documentation, which is not that you know vital for the for the community. If we write documentation for those transnational access uh, scholarships, it can be just you know archived and stored safely somewhere. But the code that's that's a big thing, right? The code and something like uh, this deliverable, right? Which is now a subdomain uh, of the domain CLS infra.io, which is again hosted by our uh, institute, but I cannot promise that it will be hosted forever. So um, uh, there were some ideas of converting this. That's not a word, a word press, that's, that's a different, that's a different uh, site, but our main site is uh, WordPress. So there are some tools to convert it to uh, static HTML, I can put it somewhere to stay forever. Which, yeah, that's that's a cool question indeed. And same question. Um, um, being here in Graz, uh, experiencing the 2023 conference, my memories uh, are coming back to 2016 in Krakow when uh, I was organizing the conference a couple of years ago, right in Krakow. And we had this uh, website and the books of abstracts and whatever it was, and it stayed for a very, very long time, but I'm not sure if it still stays mm -hmm. uh, at art homes. We have the same problem with DH Benelux. It's a yeah. challenge, yeah. It is, it is. One thing maybe to add, I think this is great, um, and getting into more um, the, the social sciences and humanities open marketplace, and the EOSC, the European Open Science Cloud, and you can add things to there. So for example, the GitHub repository, you could describe it with all the links, and then at least it's kind of out there in, in the wider field, as well as a description, yep, and a yep, solid yep. description. So that could be interesting. That's cool, that's cool. Yeah, well. that's Plus, you know, the teaching materials from the schools, they are all in this uh, um, the Daria campus. Um, okay. Site or repository. Vicky right? is the Vicky mm -hmm. is the person behind that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, I was actually going to mention that as well, but you've done that for me. But I do have a question. Um, mm -hmm. Going back, way back to the beginning of your presentation, where you were talking about the different methods and what have you, um, and particularly about the introduction of statistics. Um, to computational literature or to literary studies as a whole. Um, I, I wanted to muse on that for a little bit and wondered if you might join me. Um, but um, when I, way back when I started my PhD a millennium ago, um, I gave a presentation and um, in that session, I was then asked the question by one of the members of the, um, the, the audience, I suppose, want of a better word, um, whether or not I was going to apply statistical analysis to my results. Um, and I wasn't at that point, but then afterwards, a very renowned linguist came up to me and said, there's an awful lot of discussion about, lingu about statistics in linguistics these days. It doesn't need to be in there. You can, you can interpret these results. And I'm wondering what, what the general field around using statistics in literary studies feels okay. <laughs> about okay. that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's definitely a division into those different denominations. There are some people that don't choose um, don't use statistical inference at all. We just use um, um, descriptive statistics to show show some trend lines or whatever, right? Pie charts, and it's it's already you know some some um, some signal is is on the surface, so we don't have to go deep to to extract that. But sometimes when the samples are not very big or there are some constraints, I mean, the distributions of your, of your interests are not met, um, then additional machinery is really, really welcome. 
And I mentioned in my talk this in the introduction to whatever it was, statistics. It was, it was way back, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no problem at all. Uh, analyzing mixed data with, uh, with art by Harold Bayen. Um, that's the book um, that was my Bible for some time, like 10 years ago, but now my new Bible is, is something else. This is Mac, Mac Alrith, um, Statistical Rethinking, and he's doing the so-called Bayesian um, inference. That's a way new, not new, but way different way of thinking about statistical inference and building a model to in order to extract as much as, as possible from this very very scarce um scarce samples for example so there's this this big machinery that you can use when your uh, data is kind of not ready to confess right then you have to <laughs> massage it a bit <laughs> So you're right that there are some questions that that's which you don't really have to use the machinery, right? And some other questions to, to those hidden patterns that are very difficult to extract. And statistical methodology might help. Well, you already talked a bit about uh, sustainability, sustainability of the materials you create, et etc. et cetera. But what about the sustainability after the project of the community that you have created? Because the people, it's not just the people who work in the projects, probably also the people who are using all your materials. And there is a risk that that will just collapse because yeah, yeah, exactly. after the project. That's right, that's right. Uh, that's why I'm so glad that this community is mostly uh, connected with to, to the DH conference, which you know travels around the world, but every year is somewhere in somewhere. <laughs> an exception like three years ago right so that's that's one uh good thing and another thing is that um this community has evolved from the, the cost action distance reading led by christoph chef out here and we just smoothly um they went from one project to a to, to this different one to the cls infra and i hope to uh to find another project to just you know push it even further but of course it's not sustainable forever to just uh, jump from one project to another so there needs to be there needs to be uh, like this this community but to me if there's enough of those deliverables uh, resources tools uh, like you know Clarin has achieved this this status if Clarin dissolves one day you know it will stay in people's memory right so it will the community is there so I hope to to get to that point one day so that the CLS interpreters as, as a consortium is not needed anymore because the, the, the network is sustainable by, the, by itself. I hope. That would be great. I don't know. Mm. One, one, oh, small, one small question. Did it take a lot of effort to convince the people in the team to join all these platforms like Chatter and Mastodon? Mm -hmm. This is a challenge that I had in another project that Daria and I were working on called Upscares. And we are a consortium of about five or six uh, universities. It took a lot of time, and in the end, we just stopped. Uh, we just used email, email, but that was no. It that is, was really really challenging. <laughs> it it is, a nice it's, collaboration in the team. It still is, and some of my colleagues don't use this master the matter most thing, mm -hmm. but I convinced them to at least turn the notifications on. So if they got a new email, hey, there's something waiting for you in this matter most instance, please run it. And please, please fire it up and, and look, right? They do. And, and that's, you know, it takes a day or two for them, but uh, it's a minority, but there are still some people hard to convince mm -hmm. to use those, those technologies. So Maremos was is the most important one, I mean, the chatter, yes. but at the same time, the most uh, difficult to convince people to jump into. Uh, the older people, the younger colleagues, like the students, PhD students, you are born like, the chatter in their hands, that's, that's amazing. You don't have to convince them at all. <laughs> this was them to convince me that this chatter might be a good idea. <laughs> and it was, actually it was. So welcome everyone. Um, I'm Tomasz Ryavec, and I'll be presenting joint work with Matthias Kopp from Towns University. Uh, he's unfortunately not here, even though he did a lot of work for him. <laughs> We're talking uh, about present and Katya Medin, who is here. And given that it's a pretty box workshops, we decided to well split the presentation. I'll do the first part and Katya will do the second part. 
so what I will talk about, I'll give you a quick introduction to the Parliament project, then a couple of words about Git and GitHub. Uh, we'll do analysis of the collaboration, which is in a way the main point of this paper and some conclusions. Uh, so the Parliament projects, these are so-called Eric, uh, sorry, Clarin Eric flagship projects. It was the first time uh, Clarin Eric tried something like that with Parliament One, and that took place uh, 2020, 2021, and currently ongoing is a, a extension of the project, which will uh, end in well a couple of months, basically, uh, and. In a way, quite important for this talk is that it's a joint effort of uh, very many partners, approximately 25. Sometimes it's a bit difficult to count, uh, <laughs> which also means that collaboration is, is quite difficult, especially as Parliament started in uh, during COVID. Uh, and even then, this is not a huge uh, European project where so you have budgets to, for meetings. So, most of the partners we actually never saw uh, each other except by Zoom, right? So it's all remote collaboration. Uh, the idea of Parliament is that, well, the focus is to center uh, around compiling a set of comparable, richly annotated corpora of parliamentary debates in Europe. Uh, now, uh, parliamentary debates have quite a lot of nice properties as regard, uh, in regard to making them into a corpus. So most of the countries, or by now all of them, I think, have parliamentary debates online already. Uh, you don't have any problems with copyright. You don't have any problems with privacy protection, GDPR, these things, because it's all the uh, people talking there and public figures. And so we can do a database out of them. Uh, and so also really nice. On the other hand, of course, it's a very interesting uh, text type because lots of people are interested in what is being said in the parliament. Um, and yeah, uh, it's not only linguists, but also uh, historic uh, 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 political scientists, historians, and other people from the SSH community are interested in what is being spoken there. Uh, now, lots of countries have actually produced already parliamentary corpora, but a overview that Clarin Eric was actually doing in the scope of their uh, resource family project showed that all these corpora are encoded differently, are available via different interfaces and so on, so you can't really get a comparable set of these corpora for European languages. Anyway, that was the point, uh, not the only point, because Parliament also has uh, engagement activities, how to get people to actually use the corpora, uh, tutorials and so on, uh, but still, without the corpus itself or the corpora, you couldn't really do much. So Parliament One, uh, it, as I said, that finished in 21, uh, we produced a corpora for 70 parliaments, that's about half a billion words, 11,000 speakers, plus linguistic annotation over all the corpora for which we use the universal dependencies framework, uh, and of course software that produces these kind of annotations. So that's basically you get lemmas, uh, morphosyntactic or morphological features, as well as syntactic parses, syntactic dependency parses. Uh, so that's universal dependencies and also named entity annotations according to the standard five, uh, five class scale. Um, Parliament two, uh, we very recently, uh, so as you see a couple of days ago almost, uh, we released uh, Parliament 3.0. So that's already available in the um, in a Clarin repository as well as uh, via concordancers. And tomorrow there is in fact a tutorial on how to use parliament in concordancers. Uh, so that's 3.0. So that's kind of plain text. You have all the annotation in there, but the text is just text. And then there is also a variant of this corpus uh, dot ANA for analysis, which also contains the linguistic annotations. Uh, so you can get that from the repository, uh, not only in the source EI version, but also in uh, various derived formats, which are maybe a bit easier to use, as well as, as I said, in the planning concordances. So here's a brief kind of a synoptic overview of the countries that are involved. Uh, I should say in Parliament too, it's not just countries, it's also autonomous regions. In particular, we have uh, Galicia and Catalonia, and hopefully we'll also get uh, the Basque country. Uh, so 
the dark green ones are the ones that are actually present in 3.0. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the light ones are the ones that we still have uh, great hopes that they will deliver by the next version, which is 3.1, uh, which will be released at the end of the project. Uh, so, uh, in a way, this is quite a difficult project to manage because what we wanted to do is, as I said, produce a set of co comparable corpora so that the information in them is comparable. On the other hand, they should also be interoperable, which means that you can use the same software to process any of these corpora. And that's really difficult uh, because, well, all these partners need essentially to code their corpora in identical, in an identical way as well. Uh, but of course, you have very different parliamentary systems with their own rules, traditions, and so on. Uh, the source formats that the partners got are very different. Uh, the, the target encoding, so what we actually wanted to and what we did uh, to produce is, is quite rich. You have lots of metadata on speakers, on the uh, political parties they belong to, um, yeah, what gender they are, uh, and then it depends on the corpus also, maybe what kind of education they have when they were born, uh, what their official URL is uh, with their bio and so on and so forth. Uh, the transcriptions are quite... Um, uh, marked up um, in a rich way as well. So for each utterance, for each speech, you know who spoke it. And that is, of course, then linked to their name and, as I said, political party affiliation and so on and so forth. Uh, and we also put quite a lot of effort, and some people say that's kind of, we put too much effort in that, uh, to retain the transcriber notes. Because once you get the transcription of of a parliamentary proceedings, the transcribers will also put notes in them, like shouting from the benches or applause mm -hmm. or uh, whatever. We kind of thought that's uh, that's a nice thing to keep because maybe somebody will want to research those things as well. Uh, and as I mentioned already, we also have linguistic annotation. So quite a lot of uh, information is added to the raw transcriptions in the corpora. Uh, last but not least, uh, why it was difficult is because, uh, as I said, many partners and also with quite different backgrounds. And that, of course, uh, makes the whole thing, uh, well, uh, more complicated as well. Uh, so the kind of technical infrastructure uh, we used here, first of all, uh, as far as encoding goes, we wanted to, to use some schema, not that we come up with another schema again um, for encoding parliamentary debates, but something that is a schema that is documented, robust enough to be able to encode all the kinds of uh, phenomena we wanted to encode, and that it's also maintained and maintainable. So what we did is we chose the text encoding initiative, rather a, a very tight specialization of the text encoding initiative guidelines for the, for the base encoding. Um, we wanted to do very strict validation, uh, of course, you can do some validation via the PI XML schema, and you just use a XML validator to do it. We wanted to do more than that, so we also have an XSLT script that does like content validation and whether things are coherent inside the corpus. Um, and we also use XSLT for these conversion procedures, so you can get from the TI to plain text format or ConnellU format, uh, TSV files for metadata, and so on. Uh, finally, we also have uh, functional validation, I would call that, namely once you take a corpus, even though it's been validated and you convert it to some other pro, um, format, you can the conversion procedure can show some errors. Uh, we also convert it to the so-called vertical format so we can mount it on the concordancers. And once you see it on the concordancer, you get a synoptic view of your corpus and you can again spot errors. So we went through this cycle quite a few times and 3.0 is the latest result. But again, the main idea of this result uh, of this release is so we can spot, well, even more errors, but also add some metadata and then have the final project release 3.1. Mm -hmm. uh, for the collab collaborative development platform, uh, we wanted something to support versioning, attribution, and comparison. So we chose Git as probably the most popular platform that exists right now. So a few words on uh, Git and GitHub, we already uh, heard before uh, some words on this. Um, it's a, well, it's a distributed version control system for software development, and it's one of many version control systems, but it is, I think, uh, well, I'm sure, the most popular currently and probably will remain so for quite a while. 
Uh, but it is quite difficult to master, especially if you want to you know, like really understand what's happening under the hood uh, inside Git. Uh, GitHub is, uh, uh, as has been already mentioned, yeah, now it's owned by Microsoft, which, uh, yeah, I personally don't like that much, but there you go. Um, it's a hosting pl platform for Git, which also has some further functionalities that Git itself, uh, itself doesn't, in particular issues. Uh, GitHub pages, where you can directly publish stuff, uh, and GitHub actions, so there you can tie program code to a commit or to a pull request and uh, yeah, to other actions. Uh, it's not only used for uh, software development, even though that was the initial idea, but it is used quite a lot nowadays for uh, other digital uh, textual resources, so for data, text-based data. Um, you have uh, yeah, TI customizations, uh, like the LTEX schema that we heard about before, uh, language resources, again, uh, the LTEC project put all its, um, the complete corpora uh, under GitHub. Uh, there's other examples, uh, like universal dependencies, tree banks are also under Git. There's also digital editions, dictionaries, and so on and so forth. So uh, the DH community uses uh, Git quite a lot nowadays as well. Uh, so our address for the parliament uh, is what you see here. And what we have on GitHub are the complete guidelines for encoding, also published guidelines. Uh, so on GitHub pages, the schemas, the complete set of scripts that we use, uh, all the metadata, but only samples of data. The reason for this is essentially that the complete parliament corpora is just too large to host on GitHub. Uh, but this is something that people can directly go on, on the web and see how these things look like. Uh, now, the development process that we use is that we use the GitHub pages for publishing the encoding guidelines. Um, new data samples are added or revised uh, with so-called pull requests. Um, the pull requests trigger the validation so that people see whether their new samples actually pass the validations, whether they're, they're valid. Uh, and then, well, we, me and Matthias essentially can put comments and explain what is why things that are wrong are wrong and how to fix them and so on. Um, and these publishable samples and derived formats are also again made by GitHub Actions, uh, whereas the complete corpus has to be uh, validated locally. As I said, it's just too big. Uh, and that's a, a self-documented Unix make file that does it, which then calls various XSLT scripts and so on. Uh, so, well, this is just a kind of synoptic view how this looks like. I don't think I should go into much uh, detail because I'm almost out of time for my part. Um, communication, uh, in a way, the central uh, theme of today is uh, in Parliament 1, some partners did use GitHub issues. I kind of gently pushed them in this direction, but quite a few used emails, and that for me it was quite a burden, I have to say, because you have to answer the same question over and over again. Emails get lost and so on. As again, we heard in the previous talk, emails are not a good way to communicate. So in Parliament 2, we really try to enforce the use of GitHub issues and pull request comments for all the communication of all the partners. And I have to say this, yeah, it had a partial success. Some people just couldn't be moved from their uh, preference on email. So some some stuff was uh, still done via email. So I, I will leave the floor to Katya about the collaboration analysis that we did. Hi, I'm Katya, and I will be uh, going through the presentation on the survey and the analysis of the collaboration. So firstly, uh, first part of the analysis was through the survey that has been conducted within the parliament project. So to solicit feedback from our partners. We received answers from, uh, from 35 participants and in looking at the parliament countries and regions that we have covered, we got uh, replies from 20, uh, 24 out of 31 parliament countries and regions, which is a good coverage, but not a lot of replies. So, but it was enough to give us some kind of feedback on how to maybe further improve our workflows for next iteration, hopefully next iterations of the project. Um, so the focus of the survey was on the workflow, the Git and GitHub features, as well as TI encoding process, 
But for, for this particular um, analysis, we discussed here only the Git and GitHub related uh, questions and answers. So first we wanted to look at who were our participants. Like I said, this was, uh, or has, as it was said, uh, we had more collaboration and we had uh, people participating from different research backgrounds. So we had, we have kind of um, split the group, the participants into two groups, the DH and H group, which was around 17 participants. So these were participants that had in their combinations also put, uh, backgrounds in humanities and digital humanities, as well as the non-DH group with 18 participants with, with mainly NLP or CS backgrounds. So uh, first, it is important to know that we have participants coming from mostly a uh, combination of research backgrounds rather than just singular research backgrounds. Um, and for those 13 participants, we had only one research background, um, while the most common background combination was NLP and CS. Um, with, and this maybe could be better seen in the next figure. So we have the DH or age group in the green columns with eight, uh, with the blue ones for the non-DH and age group. This was kind of an arbitrary uh, splitting, but we kind of wanted to uh, see how much the people from the humanities, how was this workflow, which was very technical, how did it impact them? And uh, look at the, um, the splitting of that. So for the empty columns, these are the participants that had little to no previous knowledge of the virtual control systems, but particularly um, no previous experience with the Git versioning system. Um, so this is what we wanted to look for the participants to see who they are. And then uh, we would like to also present the figure that gives like a broader overview of the experience of the participants um, in the project. So these are uh, replies and the average values of the scores for several statements in the single um, answer table that we have, where we have asked our participants to score each statement on the scale from zero uh, from one to five. And um, this is also split to see the comparison between the DH group and non-DH group. Um, and the most highly um, rated uh, statements where I received relevant information feedback after posting an issue on GitHub issue. And I plan to use Git in my future work. So this, even without the group comparisons, these were the two um, uh, highly rated statements. Uh, and then we kind of saw a trend of the people from the DH group um, scoring several statements lower than the non-DH group. And this was this is mostly seen in the last two uh, last two statements. So the Git requirements and workflow were clearly explained in the extractions. And I had no particular difficulty in submitting the data sample, which kind of shows like a large divide between the groups. Uh, mostly, we could probably guess as to why. Uh, like I said, several people from the DH and H group did not have. Uh, previous experience with the uh, GitHub. So in generally, uh, we received positive, positive experience with the or feedback with the communication and workflow throughout the process. Although not everybody was very happy with us uh, trying to gently push them towards using GitHub issues rather than emails. And there was still a lot of communication done through an email, if I'm not mistaken. And like this is a, one of the conclusions that we can kind of outline is that people from the DH group or like SSH would be maybe more, more appropriate, had in general more difficulties in um, using Git and GitHub, as well as the workflow compared to the non-DH group. And for the conclusions, what we have learned from this experience first is that a parliament Git and GitHub tutorial should have been organized at the start of the project. So to get everybody on the same level of well, at least trying to fill in the blanks so that all the participants have some prior experience or um, usage of GitHub and Git. And therefore, uh, with this kind of 
uh, tutorials, many problems with the encoding, and following the workflow, as well as using Git would have been probably would have been avoided. Um, although there were there were some difficulties uh, that we had uh, report uh, had had reported to us. So first that the pervasive problem was the difference in encoding submitting samples. So the samples that were going to the GitHub, so data samples, and then processing the complete core pro, which was done outside of Git. Um, in addition, we kind of saw that development of the encoding was concurrent with the development of the core pro. Uh, and lastly, we believe that Git is well suited and for controlled and distributed development of the uh, language resources and coding guidelines and schemas, as well that, um, and also that the Git is not as well known in the SSH community as it should have been. So adopting it into work process could have um, smoothened out the actual uh, work process and make it much more controlled. But like it was said beforehand, uh, fully mastering Git is complicated and um, tutorials could be welcome for DH scholars or SSH scholars to kind of support them in the development. But as it is so difficult, it probably should not be only one tutorial, but maybe a series of where it could have been easier for them to learn. So for further work, we hope to continue working on the parliament schema and guidelines, producing new corpora annotation and research and other research types. Uh, as well as continue, continuing our work on the GitHub environment. And also hopefully decentralize the development of the Parliament Corpora so that anyone that wants to produce a Parliament um, compliant or uh, comparable, compatible corpus should be able to do so independently. So, and this is it from our side. And if there are any questions, and maybe Tomasz could join me here to answer any of the more technical questions. Great. Thank you very much to both of you for the presentation. Really fascinating stuff. Um, I've got two questions. One sort of probably more for Tomasz and one for Katya. Um, so um, you talked about the sample data. But if they, I didn't quite understand where they get the full data. So I understand you couldn't publish the whole data onto GitHub, but how did they, do they choose which parliaments they want? And then how do they get hold of the, the full data? I didn't quite get that. Uh, mm. Okay. So uh, more or less each part that was in charge of making their parliament corpus, depending where they came from. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the Austrian, the Austrian one and so on. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the idea all the time was to make, yeah, the complete corpus, right? That was their job. So most of them either already had the digital uh, format from before, because they already produced it in some their own format, inside their own project, or, <coughs> sorry, they went to the parliament webpage and then either the scraping there or whatever way they, that was essentially their, their job, right? So uh, the, the deal with the samples essentially was that if uh, before producing the complete corpus, they do it on a couple of files, mm -hmm. and then they try to push these files into GitHub. Mm -hmm. When that is done, uh, you have these uh, actions, these checks, and they see basically a list where the thing failed, yeah? Mm -hmm. So that <clears throat> they can get their samples okay. And with the idea is once you get a couple of files okay, you're 98% of the way towards getting everything okay, because these kind of mistakes are repetitive mistakes, typically in the coding, uh, and you you yeah you kind of polish that up, and then you submit the complete corpus to me. Uh, they were supposed to do this make file validation. Not all of them did because not all of them use Unix, for instance, and you need to do that. Uh, but still, then I do it, yeah, and then I say, okay, there is still some problems, and this is what they are, and this part went not via Git or GitHub issue, but via emails. So that was the kind of distinction there, yeah. Perfect, thank you. Thanks very much. And I love I loved your, your analysis capture. And um, you talked about the tutorials. Do you think that when you're creating tutorials for the GitHub part, is it, did you get a sense of whether it should be GitHub? Um, what I'm trying to say is you've got GitHub as a sort of a basic level, but then it's the context in using Parliament 
inside GitHub in some ways. So I just wondered if you've got a sense of um, if they needed to get to a certain level with GitHub in general, and then the sort of corpus part within GitHub specifically. Yeah, this, I guess I can speak from my own experience. This was my first time actually participating in a parliament, like workflow producing corpora for the Slovenian one. So I guess like the workflow had several very high uh, Git requirements that you were needed to uh, kind of master before you were able to feel comfortable in uh, submitting, uh, correcting errors and stuff like that. So I guess if for devising a tutorial, which we plan on doing, and it's one of the topics for a debate, I think it is better to start with the basic just to get everyone on, uh, on board. Maybe then opt for like other options, for example, using GitHub desktop is uh, not maybe the command line. So kind of getting the options ready for them to ease up the process uh, so they can focus more on the development of the corpora and not as much in trying to get their way around Git and the whole workflow submission. Thank you. I have a related question. Uh, would you, um, in the light of your experience, would you recommend to train students already at the MA level in order to upskill them to, to use GitHub and stuff before they start working on the PhD, right? Absolutely. I think that's, I would, I'm sorry, unless you want to. <laughs> no, 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 I agree 100%. I mean, that was kind of in the conclusions. I think Git could help data scientists uh, dealing with text data, in other words, digital humanities, a lot. Uh, because I had quite a bit of experience with collaborating with uh, people at our academy. And it was a constant nightmare. What is the latest version of this data set? And then we put some uh, date at the end of each file so it wouldn't get mixed up. And uh, all these things, if you have Git, you don't have to worry about them anymore because that's the job of Git, yeah, of a control system. And data is very important, especially in the light of more and more data is open. People want to do uh, or at least support reproducibility, things like that. And that's all kind of a part of Git already. So I think this would be a very good, uh, yeah, if uh, there's any digital skills that they really need from this stock and trade, I think Git would be way up there. So maybe when we design, or when you design the training, or I don't know, maybe Vicky and I, we can help as well. Who knows? Uh, then we can think also for a different target audience, big uh, students that they could use this training. Yeah. And uh, we also introduce it in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. yeah, we have another question. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask if you could expand a bit more on um, sort of the post tutorial and post submission of a corpus use and, and um, whether there's a difference between the, um, the non humanists versus the humanists in um, uptake of this and reuse and, and what have you. Ah, well, this in a way should be more a question for Zadia, yeah, I think. <laughs> because she is in charge of the dissemination work packages I get. I'm the, yeah, I'm the corpus compilation guy, really, more than how people use the whole thing. Yeah, so I don't know, do you have any? Um, so we have very good experience so far, not on a massive scale, but uh, parliament has been uh, one of the uh, themes at uh, the previous three DH hackathons in Helsinki that will uh, be presented soon in this workshop and tomorrow we have a tutorial on parliament here at this conference so everyone's welcome to jump by um i think that for the less uh, technical people what uh, this project did very well was that uh, we produced not only corpora but also made them accessible directly through a very user-friendly concordancer so linguists historians can just use the corpora directly via a concordancer which helps them, uh, I think, a lot. And we have produced two uh, very extensive tutorials uh, that are also available. Uh, one is on how to use a concordancer to ask, um, ask research questions or the common features. And the other one is more on text mining, how to use basic text mining tools like topic modeling um, for people who do not have any programming skills. I just said that, uh, uh, which university was that? In the Netherlands, that in the scope of two graduate theses, they produced 
new interfaces towards Parliament, which have functionalities that the concordance actually doesn't kind of trends uh, through time and so on. Yeah, so that's I think I was quite excited about that development as well. Yeah. And what we're doing is we, we are also trying to see what researchers that we think could be excited about the corpus are doing with parliamentary debates in general, in history, in social science and political science. We did a literature overview um, of what uh, research questions they're interested in, which methods they're using, how they collect data. And we've uh, published uh, all of those. And now we'd like to interact with them more closely to understand if our sources are useful for them to, to take and use the research. The biggest bottleneck seems to be in a lot of these uh, political science and social science oriented research is that what they're interested in is uh, very contemporary data. And obviously when projects like this stop, they won't be able to be updated with very new data uh, very frequently. And this seems to be a, frust a source of frustration for a lot of those users. Is that something that it being a git based thing could support the um, further development or the further? To an extent. I mean, the greatest bottleneck is that the people who just finished making their corpus should then again go to the parliament websites, mm -hmm. create the new data, maybe by hand have to add new people, because I don't know if you have elections, you know, new parties appear and you, you yeah, and you have to put that metadata in. Okay, so it's additional burden. It is, it is, yeah, regardless of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. After the workshop, I can share with you all the links that Daria mentioned, how to access the corpora and on planning C. Because there is very, I checked it yesterday actually for the Obscures project or the summer school that we're preparing for uh, for MA students and MBA students that will come to Serbia for the summer school. And uh, it was really, really nice because I created, I went to C and I made an overview of the corpora available in their languages so that the teachers can use them during the, the summer school. It's very easy to query and use, no technical skills needed. It's, it's, it's really great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. You. Sorry, one final comment at the end. I just wondered if it would be nice to capture once people have been using it. So I don't know if this is, could be something in the SSH open marketplace, but if the if Parliament is sort of onboarded there, and then in somehow I'm not quite sure, but within there you could link or have some sort of way to capture the publications that have been made on top using the corporate or something like that, so you mm -hmm. can. If that may help new people using it. They can see, ah, yes, yeah, so and so did this and that, and we'd be very happy with this as well. And we've been trying to actively creating lists of where people have used it, but it's very hard to motivate people to let you know that they used it. Um, even our own team, they put a poster on Facebook, and I happen to be friends with them on Facebook, but in meetings they don't mention that they have a poster on Facebook. So it's you know. Maybe a, a Zenodo community or something like that, where but people we, can... We already have Parliament on SSH Open Market. Right, so if we can yeah. maybe find a way to connect people and encourage people as part of the dissemination person to link back and cite it as well. Because I think if we can start citing the that we use, then it... It all goes into this ecosystem. Yeah. At the very least, what we could do add immediately would be the posters from the hackathon groups. Ah, nice. yeah. 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 Yes. Cool. Thank you. So, thank you. I hope everyone can hear me since I'm joining you from Sweden today. Uh, I'm going to talk about a project called Going to the Market Together. And it's a mixed methods project with uh, we are five participants coming from different backgrounds and disciplines, which I will mention a bit later. Uh, I would try to do this basically in two two sort of larger parts or chunks. I would start to talk about the project as such, talking about the humanities background of the project and what we are trying to achieve, and then I will try to put on the more technical hat. Um, Unfortunately, no, none of the tech, technical people were able to, to join us today. Um, but I would try to put on a more technical hat and talk a little bit about challenges, solutions, and so on. Um, but I will start to talk about uh, our interest in the market. 
that's the that's the running point of the project as such um and we we started by being interested in noting that market can be seen as mainly a spatial and temporal phenomenon when you look back in time this is obviously an historical project um focused on language studies and and market can be a place that you go to that ha it has been so historically but this is still the case today you can go to the vegetable market or so the fish market in in many places all over the world um but when we started to plan this project one thing that we had in mind was that this spatial temporal phenomenon can be seen from another perspective we could also talk about market as an abstract entity um the market um for for stocks the market for goods and so on and this is not a, a very recent phenomenon but this is something that we think has developed over time uh and if we look on on market as a phenomenon today you could also see market as something that has uh, a sort of agency a market can be agents in 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 actions and so on market reacts market punishes market pleases and so on so when we started to talk about this project several years ago we we had this in mind that the market seems to be a phenomenon that exists over time and it has a concrete definition but has also over time developed to become a more abstract and almost agent entity uh, and this leads us to uh, the project as such it is a multidisciplinary project and it has always been planned as a multidisciplinary project uh, where we focus on market as a concept and from an historical point of view um, it is it is easy to forget that market the market has not been a dominating concept as it is today historically today you can talk about the market as as an agent you can talk about market for for many 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 things from from um the public sector to the private sector you can talk about the dating market and so on so the market seems to per seems to be um everywhere today but this is definitely not the, the the case historically even if you look back no more than 100 years and of course much more so if you look back even longer so uh, a basic research question from the humanities group of the product is how have people talked about mar markets and therefore therefore given uh, meaning and significance to the phenomenon of the market from the Middle Ages to the present. And we take a theoretical starting point in the history of concept studies, uh, where you can see concepts um, as um, indicators of and also factor in historical change. Um, this is an important fact, and this is also something that links the historical perspective of perspective of the project to discourse linguistics um, and also what needs to be said when we present the project as such is that the history of the market as a concept is actually largely unwritten there are obviously quite a lot written about market and market theory from economic perspective but not so much from a concept a concept perspective and this is something that we took into account when we planned the project and asked for funding as well so yes this is the sort of foundation of the project um and in order to make this possible to study we have worked with um periodizations um for how to study this conceptual change you can talk about context driven research questions that are a little bit more detailed and remember we're still sort of working with the humanistic perspective here I'm still having my my humanistic hat on um so one way to look at this is to look at the stable market the way market and, and markets have been perceived as uh, physical temporal spatial locations and here we can talk as I mentioned before 
about a long line from medieval times to the present, um, but maybe with a focus on the early modern times when the concrete definition of, of the concept of market was, was uh, dominating. Then we have a period of the problematic market, uh, when the market started to develop as an entity. You could talk about movements toward market equality and a new commercial landscape that happens in the late 1700s uh, up to the early 1900s. And there was definitely a, a discussion and almost a heated debate about markets. And this was, of course, a power struggle between different groups in society. Uh, we can then talk about a third period, the productive market, when the market concept makes new ground. You can talk about expansion, diversification of markets from the 1870s to the 1970s. And this is obviously quite closely linked to industri industrialization. And the latest period is then the dominant market from the 1980s to the present, which can be linked to the phenomenon of financialization. And this is something that we have tried to use in order to make uh, the study of market concept in the Swedish context more, more workable. This leads us to the team. When we plan this team, we try to plan already as a multidisciplinary group. Uh, my colleague Hendrik Björk is professor of history of ideas. We have Leif Runefeld, who is professor in economic history, myself, uh, who have worked in discourse and text linguistics. We are, let's say, the humanities group of the, of the project. And then we have our colleagues from computational linguistics, Nina Tamasebi and Shafkat Verk. Uh, and we all work together in order to plan the project. And we, we received funding for four years from the, the Swedish Marcus and Amalia Wallenberg Foundation, and we started to work uh, last fall. We have also ample co-funding from our respective universities. We represent three universities and several different departments within one university. So this is the project team. Um, this leads on to uh, the theme of the workshop, which I've tried to, to address. Uh, also in the paper, we have tried to address that in the paper about remote collaboration. Uh, we can talk about remote collaboration in several ways for this project. And of course, there is the question of physical remoteness. But I think more prominent is that we have two groups of scholars involved in this project. Firstly, we have this humanities group uh, we, that have together developed the theoretical idea and actually came up with the idea quite some years ago. And then secondly, we have the group which have the expertise of doing large scale analysis of text corpora. Um, and you can talk about the kind of remoteness that occurs because of the different conceptions of methods, theories and terminology uh, that comes with this multidisciplinary group. And what I will try to focus on uh, a little bit later in is what do these different um, competences entail for the project. I will also add a few words on corpora because I haven't really added any slides on that. And I realize that many of you are interested in that. Uh, we work with basically all the texts in Swedish that we can find. We are not picky. Uh, we have worked with the uh, Clarine resource, the Swedish Language Bank, where there are a lot of public texts available. We have worked with press texts. We have worked with public texts from parliaments um, and so on. And the further back you get in history, of course, the messier and smaller the materials are. One, one material that we also have developed on our own are the parliamentary data of the Swedish bicameral parliament from the 1800s to 1970, and also the even earlier parliament data of the estates. Uh, the, the Riksdag of the Estates. And these are data that are not previously annotated from a linguistic point, but that's something that we have done if you have questions about that. But in general, we try to work with as much text corpora as we can and, and also on, on a large scale analysis level. So um, a little bit about challenges then. 
some examples of that. Um, and this also has to do with the implications of that we are having different competencies and come from different research fields, also share a different different languages within the research group. Not everyone, you know, everyone knows Swedish as an example. Um, and one first challenge was that how do we translate these qualitative, mainly qualitative research questions that I gave you some examples of initially here on how market as a concept has developed over time and also how market as a concept have been used in different discourses. We needed to, to, to um, translate these research questions in a way that they could be approached uh, computationally. And then this adheres to the second challenge, the, the use of area specific terminologies and the fact that we often take for granted that concepts that appear as simple in one academic profile um, are not always equally understandable for scholars working in other academic profiles. This brings, of course, additional challenges in this type of collaborative project. And I think we were quite aware of the first challenge when we started to work with this during the fall and early spring this year. Uh, but during this work, we became more and more aware of the second challenge. How do we translate? How do we use, how do we use, um, technical terms, technical concepts uh, in order to, to explain how to, how to approach these questions. Uh, and I will say that this is, this is the main challenge for the initial part of the project and which we have tried to overcome. And I think we also have overcome in several ways. Uh, and just some brief examples is that we together came up with a solution that we formulated questions in the words of, let's say, the humanities group, the historians, and me, myself, the discourse linguist, in order for these questions to be operationalized for the computational linguists. So two examples that we came up with from the historical group was, is it possible to identify the words that accompany, let's say, market words in 18th and 19th century text in order to differentiate between physical concrete markets and the more abstract meaning of market. Um, and the solution to this was to um, compute co-occurrence patterns of market words with other words, and also classify these co-occurring words into different expressions of time and date. We tried also some other stuff with actors and to use these to differentiate the physical and abstract, abstract sense of a market. This goes, of course, back to, to um, what I talked about before, that we have this sort of working hypothesis that the concrete definition of market has been broadened by the abstract definition of market over time. And we are also aware of that the concrete use of market is still existing today. So we wanted basically to see how and when and in what kind of text does abstract meanings first occur in, in what ways. So this is one example in how we try to, to translate something that comes from the humanities group of the project into something that the computational linguists can work with. Um, we also looked into the possibility to see change over time in how market as a single lemma is used um, with compound lemmas in contrast to compound lemmas with market. Uh, and this is a bit of a special feature in Swedish and the Nordic languages, also in German, where it's very, very simple to form new compound lemmas with market or, of course, other nouns as an, as an element, either as an, a prefix or a suffix element. Um, and this is also something that we looked into and used as uh, a bridge from the research questions to, let's say, operationalized questions. But I want to show you some more examples of uh, how we worked with the co-occurrences. Co uh, and this is where I try to put on the technical hat. My colleague Shafkat has worked with this, of course. And we did it um, on, let's say, the group level as an interplay of our competencies. This was not sort of uh, a task that we gave to the computational linguists and then left them with it. 
we try to work with interplay and and and, and uh, continuous communication when we did this in order to actually check that this worked so what um the computational linguists did was that they took texts we used texts from the earlier swedish parliaments that i mentioned before uh one from let's say 1600 to the 1860s and then from 1867 to 1970 and they were split into 10-year bins in order to to keep them workable and each of these decade bins were then annotated with different kinds of metadata mainly linguistic metadata uh, remember this was parliament data that hasn't been annotated uh, and put into clarion infrastructure before we looked into as one example we looked into a comparison between indefinite and definite forms of market um, market is a practical word it has sort of um, uh, equivalence in many languages in Swedish it's marknad and since Swedish does have a, a morphological definite article uh, the definite form of market in Swedish is marknaden not the market it, instead it has is, yeah, it has a prefix so it becomes marknaden and this makes it quite easy to to compare these forms of indefinite and definite um, in 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 these 10 year bins and then uh, this, of course, is a result as such, looking into the, the contrast between the indefinite and definite forms. But what the computational linguists uh, also did was that they used uh, the TSNE method, the tool, to visualize words that occur around these definite or indefinite forms of market, marknad or marknaden, and also including frequencies for these co-occurring words, since the number of words sometimes were quite small um this is a very short version and remember i'm not a computational linguist but this resulted in some interesting uh interesting uh results or outcomes uh for one one we we could see that the definite form of marknad marknad and becomes more used than the indefinite form over some time in uh this is an example of the swedish bicameral parliament data from 1860 to 1970 uh, and this may, may imply that the definite form uh, the increased use of the definite form of the market is a possible indicator of increased agency um, in in terms of the market has spoken the market reacts and so on over time and this is just the first step this is something that we will explore more and also make a shift from let's say these quantitative analysis to qualitative analysis when we go back in and check and check examples of this so this is one example where we actually can see something happening where we have translated a qualitative research question to something uh, that can be done uh, computationally and then the second example is uh, how we have visualized words around marknad or marknaden market or the market and by comparing surrounding words around market in different time periods remember the decade the decade time bins here we can get indica indications on how level of abstractness versus concreteness changes over time um, we can also explore related words that allow us to dig deeper into usage of market as a concept market words during different time periods this is of course in Swedish uh, you can see from this example from the time bin of 1841 to 1850 that marknad in the indefinite form is shown in red here in the middle and around it you can see examples like um, trader is the one that is closest you can see place you can see uh, happening and so on you can also see summer a little bit up there so you can see many examples of the concreteness concreteness of market yet at this time but there are also some examples of more abstract things going on and of course this is something that we compare decade to decade to decade uh, sorry on too much uh, just a few words before I end also on the implications of physical remoteness of the project 
Uh, we are working in different universities and also in different departments within one university. There are actually three people working in three different departments of the University of Gothenburg. Uh, and this implies or actually makes us physically remote. And I don't think we had thought about it that much until the COVID-19 pandemic happened, as has been mentioned in previous speeches here, here, here as well. And being distant from each other were, uh, was a bit of an obstacle for the planning of the project. And it was also fairly complicated during the pandemic. Uh, this is something that we, that we actually obviously need, need to note on. Um, perhaps more important is that we have different routines and standards for sharing information. Uh, let's say from paper to the use of Slack and Discord, also something that was mentioned in the previous speeches. And I think we overlooked this, these differences more than, than the actual physical remoteness. This, this was something that we really didn't anticipate that this would be an obstacle when we planned the project, but it has been. And we are now working very much on how to share data, how to overcome technical uh, thresholds on what we actually can handle. There is a big um, uh, spectrum of knowledge, technical knowledge within the group. Um, also, just briefly, is that none of us are actually working full time with the project. Uh, all five members are also working with other projects. This is also something that complicates, um, uh, of course, the remoteness factor, the physical remoteness factor. But we have also learned or understood that communi communication and openness, this is, of course, a very mundane observation, but nonetheless very important, that together with careful coordination has helped us quite a lot. And that brings me to my last slide. Uh, what have we learned so far? We are coming up to one year of the project this fall, this September. One thing that we have learned uh, and we learned that quite immediately when we started the project is the importance of an ongoing discussion and good communication uh, in order to, to work mutually on developing method methodologies and tools for analysis. Um, related to that is the need for assessment, continuous assessment of results and functionality together with reflection uh, on how we reach usable results, both in terms of the project questions, but also in the development of the computational linguistic tools. We need to be multidisciplinary in that in that in that factor. We, that's really important that we have this this win win situation that we can both answer research questions and help our computational lingu linguist colleagues in order to for them to develop tools uh, that must be discussed all the time. Uh, so that we actually know that we that we reach results. Uh, also, we have reached insight in that we need several different tools and analysis needed for for um, to order answer these more abstract research questions. There is no perfect match between one question and one tool. Uh, we need to to continuously map how our tools work, what they can deliver. And how that match matches um, our our research questions, and that's something that we have um, discussed quite thoroughly now during the later part of of the spring. So we look forward to continue to work with this, and I will end there. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, Stephen. Well, it's not really a question. Uh, I must say that I really love your talk. When I attend uh, the, the age conferences, I'm always looking for uh, presentations that start from a research question and, and show how you arrive at your solution. Whereas many uh, presentations at this conference are about me and my tool, me and my, my platform, me and my corpus. And what I find inspiring about this is not that I'm interested in market, I'm not at all interested, but it's the idea that you take a concept and see how its meaning changes over time and if I were a teacher of digital humanities in Sweden, I would immediately start looking for similar examples in other areas where you could have the same uh, meaning shift. If I were a teacher of digital humanities in my country, I would immediately ask myself and my students, how does it work in my language? Because it's, I think it's wonderful that you've already tackled the problem, maybe not 
arriving at the final solution yet, but it would be very inspiring for students to go through the same exercise, uh, helped by your expertise, and just learn how to handle the problems and to arrive at solutions. So I think it's it's a great talk. Thank you, Stephen. Um, that that warms my heart. This is yeah. I, I I can I can agree that I did not want to talk about tools mainly, but and this is also how I interpreted the the, the workshop theme um, that try to go from the research question to the technical solution and maybe back and, and just two words on on this working with students because this is something that we actually do I'm running a workshop series together with colleagues from the English department at my own university where we invite people from especially humanities and social sciences to do exactly what you what you address there to work with um, uh, similar methods but in their own questions. And we are working especially with people from the Department of Sociology. And we have looked into the concept of multilingualism, which also translates well into, let's say, nouns and compounds in Swedish, and how, let's say, the political discourse have treated multilingualism and immigration and migration in Sweden over the years. And does this hopefully will have inspired several students and also PhD students with this. Um, thank you very, very much for the presentation. And you already um, said that um, in one of your slides, you said um, you folks are probably interested in the text corpus, um, but we haven't included slides and I would like to go into that in a little bit more detail. Um, a bit like um, in, our, in our keynote speaker, Mache, he said about Nextcloud and everything. And I wondered if you could say a, a little bit more words, because uh, a few more words about the different flows, because you're looking at different types of text from different perspectives, how you made that workable from a sort of... Yeah, yeah. Discussion. I, I, I expected this question. <laughs> <laughs> The, this, the, the Swedish language bank has, uh, since many, many years, uh, a very good internal um, interface. And the computational linguists in our project are uh, employed basically by the Swedish language bank. So they have excellent access to corpora that have existed for a long time and they, they can use them basically at free will and with any tool that they like. Uh, so in that way, it's very, it's very practical. Uh, I can try to multitask here and add a link to the Swedish language bank, uh, if you're interested, um, where there are a lot of corpora. And then th these corpora have, are not always discussed or, or, or annotated or treated in, in, um, uh, coherent ways since they have been developed over time and not always for for our sort of more discourse historical uh, perspective but since they are accessible for our computational linguists they are easy to work with uh, so we have like one one set of existing data that, ha that has been treated curated annotated for several years which is very access accessible but then we need to work with let's say the examples we have here um, from the parliament, uh, parliament data that I showed you. These are texts that we have downloaded from APIs or similar and basically put on our own servers, if that answers your question. And there is a problem or a challenge that these are not annotated or curated in any way, but this also opens possibilities since they are not, let's say, tarnished by previous work. We can do a lot of work with that too. But that cost us quite a lot of, of resources within the project to work with this uh, fresh, untreated data. And we, we, use, we use Discord, not everyone in the group, but we use Discord in order to discuss and look into um, different themes, examples, and so on. Um, and we try to, to pool examples work analysis from both, let's say, both larger categories, both sets of data when we talk in Discord. Uh, we also use Jupyter Notebook. That's mostly the computational linguists that do that. Uh, so it's, a, I wouldn't say a plethora of different resources, but we have 
quite a mix of different methods and tools that we use. And there is, as I said during the talk, a bit of a spectrum of technical knowledge, know-how within the group. So some, some things are not accessible at all for the historians, or at least for one of the historians. Um, and my job is mainly being the one that cater for both groups. I'm in the middle since I'm a linguist and I have some training in computational linguists as well. Um, and that's something that we realized that a lot of the stuff that comes out needs to be translated and curated towards both ends. So I usually try to make fast versions of results that come out for the historians, for the historians and I also try to translate reactions back to the computational linguists. That's and that, great. Thank you. Thank you for explaining that in more yeah, detail. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Klaas. Yep. Okay, great. Hello, my name is Pihla Toivonen, and my title today is Analyzing the Representation of Politicians in the Media, Results and Methodological Concerns. This presentation is a joint effort between me and my supervisor, Eetu Mäkelä, here in University of Helsinki, in Human Sciences Computer, Computing Interaction Research Group that Eetu leads. And this work is based on a collaborative project with the Finnish magazine Suomen Kuvanlehti in 2021. The wider context of this presentation is that our research group had an interdisciplinary research project with media studies scholars. The project was called Flows of Power, and this data journalism project was an offshoot of the research project. And a bit about background of this project. In early 2021, Journalists from the Finnish journal or magazine Suomen Kuvalehti approached our research group about collaborating on a data journalism article about the representation of political parties in Finnish media. We started the collaboration and the result was an article in the magazine. And you can see here the uh, article in the magazine. Our initial idea was to measure mentions of political parties in the four biggest Finnish online media in 2020. All selected media had search interfaces supporting time range and keyword queries. We noticed that all interfaces were using REST APIs where we could easily do requests. We thought that the task would be simple, collect the data and calculate the frequencies of the parties. However, we soon realized that it, it is not so. This presentation is about how to obtain a representative data set and dissect the complexity of the phenomenon when the initial objective was to study the representation of political parties in Finnish media 2020. And now a bit about the collaboration with Suomen Kuvalehti magazine. From the University of Helsinki, there were Eetu Mäkelä and me, and from the magazine Suomen Kuvalehti, there were two journalists a news producer and an infographic designer. Our task was to define interesting data sets and research questions in collaboration with the journalists and collect the data and run the analysis. Journalists wrote the article and infographic designer did the final visualizations. Our first attempt to collect the data was to search with different party abbreviations. However, we ran into problems as the search interfaces didn't recognize parentheses. When we queried only with abbreviations, for example with COC, that is abbreviation of a party named COCOMUS, we got results matching all kinds of short words such as, such as COCKI, that is chef in English, and COCO, that is whole in English. Also VIHREAT, that is greens in English, and KESKUSTA, that is center in English naturally produced problems. After this experiment, we decided to match politicians' names to avoid problems with abbreviations. When we queried by names, we encountered problems with stemming and case insensitive non-phrase matching. For example, when we queried Sanna Marin, the former prime minister, we got a potato salad receipt by Sanna Kekäläinen that talks about marinating red onions. Mm -hmm. So we had bad precision with this um, method. 
And one problem related to stemming in the search interfaces was that they didn't call catch all infected forms that we have in Finnish quite many. For example, querying Virtanen didn't catch Virtasta, Virtasen, and Virtasella. So we had bad recall with this method. And then we made some solutions. We increased recall by querying common inflected forms of the politician's names. And precision was increased by doing local phrase matching as post filtering step. With querying inflected forms that were mostly generated by this LAS tool, we got 22% more articles. And with post filtering by local phrase matching, only 53% of the articles retained. And it seemed like there was some kind of recommendation system included in the search because there were so many additional articles that we got from the search interfaces. And in this phase, we encountered a problem that this post filtering needed all full articles. So basically we had to build our own scrapers for fetching the articles. And we ended up doing own scrapers, these Finnish media scrapers, and data collection for the project ended up being a quite significant overall effort. We ended up publishing a software library and end user tools. And the tool itself has gained attention in the Finnish computational social science community outside of this data journalism project. One of the final problems in the data collections was politicians' nicknames that they use in all contexts. One of the journalists in our project noticed that Ritva Eloma was among the least mentioned politicians and realized that Ritva actually use, uses her nickname, Kike. The same problem was also noticed for another member of parliament, Harry Jallis Harkimo. So we had to rerun queries with the nicknames. And this is one example of the good collaboration that the journalists noticed this problem and we didn't notice it at all. So we ended up querying about 50,000 articles and then we did the post filtering and analysis. And then we encountered the question of what to measure. We noticed that there were long summary articles in the data as well as short breaking news articles. This gave us challenge, should we measure numbers of articles, numbers of mentions or share of mentions by articles? We ended up running analysis with different measures, but all of them pointed to similar conclusions. So first finding was that there were no significant differences in publicity between medias. In the image, the different shades of red in the bars represent different media outlets. And the names on the x-axis are Finnish political parties. We defined a mention of political party as a mention of at least one of its members of parliament in the article. From the image, you can see that there is no significant difference between the media. The only difference between the media was in Finnish and Swedish Ule News. Ule is the national public service broadcasting company in Finland. In Swedish news articles, Ule writes more about Swedish speaking politicians and it's not surprising result for us. There are differences between the parties in the number of mentions, even though they do not differ by media. Our next question was how to explain these differences between parties. We collected manually roles of the politicians in the parliament, for example, ministers, chairpersons of the parties, chairpersons of the parliamentary groups. We found that the role of the politician determines the publicity quite well. For example, you can see the difference if you compare middle image of the top row ministry and the rightmost picture 
of the lower row and a We also noticed that some parties can have more members of parliament with relatively high publicity than other parties. National Coalition Party Kokoomus has a strong second bench members of parliament who are not in the highest positions in the party, but still have uh, higher publicity than other members of parliament. According to our analysis, we had lack of large scale differences. For example, we didn't notice a statistic, statistically significant difference by gender in reporting. Then we decided to focus our analysis not on the norm, but on the exceptions from it. First, we focused on identifying members of parliament who had either surprisingly many or surprisingly few article mentions given their parliamentary roles. According to the journalists, this question was interesting from the perspective of why those in power do not want attention from the media. The journalists investigated the anomalies qualitatively, and it turned out that the politicians has had varying explanations for unnaturally many or few mentions given their parliamentary roles. For example, according to the investigation of the journalists, one member of parliament which um, surprisingly many mentions, Mikko Kerna himself writes press releases aimed at journalistic media highlighting that he what he just said on Twitter. Mm -hmm. So this anomaly investigation was also quite collaborative because the journalists started to investigate them manually. And they I think that they even called to Mikko Kerna himself to ask ask about his behavior. We also investigated the number of articles in which members of parliament are mentioned both in general and specifically related to certain MPs. The left image shows the total number of articles where members of parliament are mentioned per week. The images on the right show the individual mentions of Sanna Marin and Hanna Kosonen. From the images, it can be noticed that on a general level, article counts vary slightly according to the holiday seasons, whereas on individual level for members of parliament, variation is greater. Overall, we learned during the project that interesting results appear when contrasting stable general trends and local dynamics. Outliers were interesting in our project, but it needed different cross-cutting analysis to find the course. Then, um, what we learned from the collaboration with journalists. Working with journalists was a fluent experience as they have a lot of general knowledge, for example, in basic statistics and Excel. And at least I could clearly see the effect of their education and their work experience because they could easily follow the statistics and the plots that we produced. And in collaboration, it is important to remember that journalists and researchers may have different understandings of ethics due to their professions. For example, we had a case where journalists referred to their journalistic method of gathering information when we as researchers found scraping problematic. From the idea of let's study the representation of political parties in Finnish media, we ended up in a long mess of how to obtain a representative dataset, dissect the complexity of the phenomena, and ensure our measures are capturing what we are interested in and are sensitive to subtle dynamics, but are robust against noise, and then guard against external confounders. And then these are some final plots. These are Finnish prime ministers in like lately. So you can see that the, these dynamics of prime ministers are quite stable in the articles that mention them. And then one final result is that uh, we noticed that uh, both sentence count and 
token count in sentences have increases increased and some scholars in our research group are now or have investigated this more thank you thank you thank you very much for this this making this very complex um uh, research project and it's really interesting to see the collaboration you did with journalists that's really great um, apologies if I missed this, but you had quite a lot of complex corporate, and I just wondered, you mentioned Twitter in various different places, but what was the role of social media in your corpus? Because I can imagine that some of the titles, either of the magazines uh, or newspapers, may have had a social media component as well. So I just wondered if this was sort of a out of scope, or was it part of your main corpus? Yeah, thanks for the question. We, I think we did some, the journalists were of course interested in that question of how social media is nowadays used in the articles. And I did some um, search these for these, for example, how these Twitter posts are used in the, in the articles, but we got some numbers, but then we decided that it's not in the scope of this kind of this data journalism article, but the journalists were, I remember that they were very interested in this question, but we didn't collect any data from Twitter or anything like that. Thanks, something for the follow-up project. <laughs> yeah. Daria, I have a small, very similar question to Sally. Um, did you also measure for example, how much they spoke in the parliament with respect to how many times they were mentioned in the newspapers following, because uh, maybe they are reported on just because they have, you know, they have said more things, or is it a curation editorial process that will only highlight the high profile politicians, regardless of who speaks? Yeah. Thanks for the suggestion. I think we didn't do that because the journalists just called to the to these members of parliament and asked themselves. And then in the in the data journalism article, the journalists just wrote what the members of parliament responded. But I think it would be interesting to look at the parliamentary speeches. But we didn't do that in in this project. Sally. Maybe a short follow up one. I mean, how did you find it working with the journalists? Is there anything that you learn from them or they learn from you or that you might want to take into the next project? I mean, it's, it's kind of different angles on the same subject. And I wondered if you could say a little bit more about the sort of collaboration that you had. Yeah, first thing is that we did this during the COVID remote time so we basically did all communication in microsoft teams and then teams chats and teams calls so i think it would be a bit different experience now so i i found it quite fluent because they somehow had the knowledge of the kind of the societal questions but also of the statistical basics because sometimes when I have worked with qualitative researchers in media media studies they mean it might be that they don't have so much experience of for example reading uh, statistical tables but these journalists um, it was somehow very fluent and I think I, I learned at least from them that how to kind of because the pace of their work is faster. So they had to make ideas and create ideas faster than researchers because sometimes journalists has only one day or even less than one day in writing the article. So I learned kind of how to wrap up things in a specific time frame. And I don't know if they learned from us, maybe they learned more about these data collection methods. I think scraping and how to collect this kind of data for data journalism project. I think they learned that kind of things. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you. 
very much. And uh, apologies first that I'm not able to be there in person. I've, I've got some other commitments. I have to uh, be here in Helsinki for a couple more days. I come to Graz on Wednesday. We have a couple other other papers in the panel. Uh, so Eetu Mäkelä, my co-author for, for this and organizer of for the hackathon that I'll be talking about, he, he was supposed to be there, but Eetu had had a family emergency so so unfortunately he wasn't able to to travel so so then i'll i'll be presenting remotely which i suppose is okay because we are talking about remote collaboration <clears throat> but uh so my paper that or the presentation will be very much on education uh, digital humanities education and remote collaboration so uh i will be explaining to you I don't assume that everybody knows what is the Helsinki Digital Humanities Hackathon. Everybody probably knows what's a hackathon, but but uh, our concept, I, we we take it as a very seriously that this DHH brand is a particular kind. So not all hackathons are DHH hackathons, even when DHH hackathon is a hackathon. So th so that's that's a message that I I, I try to convey. Uh, and and then I will especially focus on the year 2021 when we transferred online and and compare the lessons that we learned from that uh, the, uh, when comparing to to the other uh, iterations of our our DHH uh, hackathons. So so that that's what I'll, I'll try to talk to you today about. Um, so. I, I really embrace the twin talk philosophy because it's very close to how we are approaching our education, digital humanities education in Helsinki. So, so interdisciplinarity is, is the core of everything. So our idea in digital humanities is not to re-educate humanities people so that they are all of a sudden both data scientists and humanities experts, but we are trying to move things forward so, so that we work in research groups where people have different kinds of expertise. And then uh, these are combined uh, so that, for example, programming should not be an issue. Everybody does some at least, but we still have data science experts and computer scientists that are, are experts in that domain. And then we have humanists who focus on other parts. So not everybody needs to do everything, but everybody needs to talk a common language. That that's also the one main objectives of the hackathon that we are trying to teach people. And and talking a common language is often more complicated than you first would think. And there you you really need the co co cross disciplinary approach, and and certain skills and theoretical knowledge needs to be learned. Also, the computer scientists need to understand things uh, about hermeneutic uh, way of thinking. There, there's all kinds of uh, different things that that has to happen over time uh, in order for people to be able to work in an interdisciplinary setting. And then also, we believe even if we work, I'm a 18th century scholar. I don't expect all of my students to become 18th century scholars. But if they work in the way that we are looking at the interdisciplinarity uh, and working with 18th century data, for example, they will be ready to work uh, together with people from computer science if when not everybody stays within the academia and they go towards the, the way that uh, life outside academia is, is set. So, so we really believe strongly in this, that, that it's possible. But at the same time, why it's education and not research only is that we really focus on the individuals. And when they come from different perspectives, then we need to uh, really think quite carefully about the different paths that we give for every person. And that's also important when we think how the hackathon uh, groups need to be led so that the individual aspects are taken into consideration and not that everybody comes from the very same mold or have the different same set of skills and comprehension and theoretical background. Now, what is the DHH annual hackathon? It's the idea that in week and a half, 
So it's 10 days uh, from scratch. There's a research project that is put up. So it's quite different from maybe a, a regular hackathon that people in the industry understand it so that you get a weekend and somebody gives you carrots and you need to come up with a new way of using carrots or, or, or something like this. Here's a problem, solve it. No, the idea is really that we start thinking about research questions that come from the humanities and we think about different methods and tools um, and the data sets that we have and then we end up normally in the in the the main part of the uh, DHH hackathon is that the groups make a conference poster uh, within this time but when we were in the online space in 21 we gave that up but final presentations have always been there and and then in the in the online form the main emphasis was on a blog post and we'll talk a little bit about that we organize the, there are always different themes that, that we do in the hackathon and every group has their own pre-selected data set. That's quite important for us so that the team leaders who are experts, they have knowledge of the data and they have some kind of personal research interest. They are the ones that are, are really leading the data sets so that, so that otherwise we feel that it would be pretty impossible within such short time to come up with research questions if we don't have real experts uh, guiding the, the processes. And then one organizational, what's very important is that all the groups are seriously interdisciplinary so that you have computer and data scientists, humanist, humanities people, social science people, all of those are, are mixed together. And the main objective uh, might be sound that it would be very simple, uh, but it's really challenging actually, and it does have broad applicability, is to find your own role. Uh, you're able to navigate complex data across multiple disciplines and, and you gain experience in this. So the most important thing in the hackathon is that we don't do it so that we have some people who have uh, very good skills, let's say, uh, in in a computational sense, and then the enthusiastic leader coming is thinking about their own research and just using these uh, computational people that are normally not available for for the humanities researcher, so that they do something that advances the research. No, it's it's much more important that that the the group is led so that uh, people are are really come as a balanced group uh, and and then the the development within the group is more important maybe than the the group's research results in the in a sense of research that's why it's it's education it's not research even when what the group does in the hackathon is which is very very close to how my research group for example works we try to mimic it but the idea isn't that that this is now in the hackathon, it's it's the work of my research group. No, because then you might easily end up losing a lot of people who are you are not uh, felt that they can uh, sort of uh, contribute. If we're thinking about MA students, the level that they can contribute to something that would be uh, sort of a cutting edge research. Uh, that that those are two different things. And also, I mean that, but anyway, what we try to do is that that we are breaking down so the barriers, so that the who is a student, who's a teacher, who's a researcher, and 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 then that uh, how does the research and teaching look? That that's also important. In 2021, we had uh, four main organizers, 20 team leaders, and 65 participants in an online space. So it was was quite a lot of people. I'll, I'll get in a second to uh, what this means. <laughs> Now, I want to make this shout out already now. So we are also Clarin and Daria Summer School, our hackathon. And for example, this year in 23, uh, we had 20 people we were sponsored uh, outside Finland. And everything uh, was, of course, I mean, the, the participation was free for everybody. So one crucial aspect how our hackathon has become is that it's truly international. So not I mean, for everybody, um, it is it is a real international event, and 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 that's quite important about the brand. Just to mention that uh, already now. 
So here's what I've been thinking when I was thinking that what are the basic ingredients for our hackathon? It's people, uh, they make the hackathon obviously, and, and that's important so that we, we get a lot of applications. So we are able to make balanced teams. So that, that's quite important. So we get more than 100 applicants every year uh, and not everybody, more than half of them do not get a place in the hackathon. Also the leadership, that's extremely important. Time, this is something that we realized early on. First, we were a five day hackathon, but we realized that, that more time is needed to get the kind of results in learning that, that we wanted. Data, thinking about the data so that, that they, are, they are really pre-selected and quite carefully selected, uh, that, that's important space whether you're online or in person of course that makes it makes a huge difference but but also how the space is organized so it needs to be convenient it needs to be something that that actually works yeah. also the computing environment in finland uh we use uh this center for scientific computing we get basically everything that that we need if we need a lot of computing hours to process the data we have that uh so that that's quite well uh, in our case also deadlines and deliverables, how they are designed, that's extremely important for, for the how, how well we are able to do. So as in real research, deadline is your best friend, even if it doesn't feel like that. And also the deliverables that, that the people learning uh, that we have to actually deliver. So that, that's, that's extremely important. Social events, they always been very, very important. So making this cohesiveness also across the the groups uh, that that's that's important, and of course committed sponsors. So without Clarin and Daria, sort of a, over time sponsoring us, we couldn't have developed ourselves into an international interdisciplinary uh, and and an international event, and then iterative development. So we are very very conservative in a way that that we feel that we're not conservative with the, what we are doing, but changing uh, these, some of the crucial components when we know that something works. Uh, we get people suggesting that, couldn't you now just do this or do that? We are uh, very conservative in, in the sense that uh, we try to think quite carefully, iteratively what, what we want to do. And just about about uh, still uh, what the hackathon is so when we think about research or teaching or teaching in research so this is this is very very important so so kind of keeping a balance uh when we were in the online if you want to look at some of the results all of the results from all the groups from different years are available online but but here's a, a group that i led uh in 21 uh, when we were online and there we experimented with a little bit going more towards the research side. So not only thinking about the indi inter individual's development, but also that we want to do something in a, in a research setting, uh, trying to think about this boundary, what is a research, what is teaching and teaching in research. Um, that, that was maybe one of the years when we went the furthest towards actual doing research. Uh, what in in the groups that i i've led myself usually i'm a general organizer so i don't i try to uh stay away from a particular work that a group is doing but the online year was a little bit different also if you want to look at uh examples like i said they are all available online there's a continuity in the data uh that we have so most of the years we've been going so that we have newspaper data uh, which is a it's a good good way of going about uh, there's plenty of it available there's always a or has been a like social media uh, component twitter data quite often uh, so we try to get social science people in, included as much as possible there's always an early modern data uh, both texts and and nowadays going more and more towards the materiality of things, images and other ways of, of thinking about the data. Uh, and parliament data has become a, a more and more important for us uh, also because collaborating with parliament uh, is, is very, very important. Next year, uh, I, I said that this at the end of the hackathon, that we might think about including Eurovision, which would be great, but we are just worried that too many people want to join that group. But well, let's see if it happens. 
But okay, now now I want to talk a little bit about the 21 year, uh, which was the, well, of course, the COVID year when we went online. So what happened in fifth, from 15 until the 19th, we were always in person. There was no even thinking about the online uh, choice. Then in the 20, we were already, all the preparations were ready. Preparations take a long time. We start uh devising the next year's hackathon already in some time, usually when the, the other year ends. And uh, by January and February, we are quite far. So when the COVID hit in 2020, uh, we were thinking for a while that should we go online? We were ready to go ahead. Everything was ready for the in-person hackathon. Uh, but then we decided, and I think we made a very good choice of not trying to transfer into online form then. So it was canceled completely. 21, we had plenty of time to plan uh, and, and then we were online and, and that's what I will be talking about. After that, 22 and 23, we've been back to in-person uh, one uh, because of course that's, that's, we feel that that's the main, main part of uh, Helsinki Digital Humanities Hackathon. So online uh, 21, of course, this was a very, very different kind of a year had to be planned uh, quite differently when we compare it to the in-person hackathon. We had a lot more uh, organizers and team leaders. You might notice there's some familiar phrases from, from Clarin and, and Daria uh, and, and, and also other people about the participants. We had then people from a lot of people from different backgrounds, 24 people from computer science, Arts and Humanities, 33 people, and Social Sciences, 12 people, people from 28 different countries and, and speaking 38 languages. So we were quite quite happy how, how well the participation group uh, worked then. Um, we were also thinking, I mean, the, we were quite careful, very careful uh, when we we're picking the data sets and the themes. And we had a little bit more uh, meetings and additionals, even more additional days to work. work. And we used this gather town as a as a place of meeting uh, in in a live kind of space. So so the social structure was very very different. Uh, now, if I think about the these basic ingredients and 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 what happened in the online, so people from more different time zones were able to participate. Of course, this creates a, a difficulty with respect to the space uh, because the communication strategies have to be different if we have people from Australia and US and, and Finland. So, so we had some groups had this kind of rolling uh, meeting way of doing things so, so that people could come whenever they, they were ready and there were some common meetings, but this was quite difficult to to organize. Uh, leaders, of course, had much more uh, freedom and with freedom comes responsibility and, and some unknown uh, ways. And we were able to then for data and computing environment, we were able to use the, the kind of continuity from the in-person ones. I mean, obviously the working with the data and computing is not so different um, and 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 so forth, but but there was still uh, much more groups were, were different, let's put it like that. And the social events, uh, those obviously didn't work. So I, in my, my perspective, even when we had the, the gathered town, there, there were one group, for example, opted out. There were people who didn't like gathered town, so, so they opted out completely. They just did Zoom. Uh, but but a lot, of course, it's uh, is lost. And well, one positive thing, of course, the, the organizing is way cheaper. Uh, obviously, nobody has to has to travel. We don't have to buy food for anyone. So so then uh, the sponsorship question uh, goes down in a way. But also the daily communication became between groups became became quite quite difficult. Uh, and and I'm not. That, that's something that I, I've been later thinking when we gave up the traditional posters and went to blog-based presentations. There, there's both good and bad in that. Uh, I mean, the, the reason for giving up the posters was that there is no poster session in the in the traditional sense uh, because people are not there physically. 
but of course, like we all we know that there's there's conferences with with uh, poster presentations online. It's not a not a problem as such. But so the lessons, if I put like about the online environment, is that that you really need to plan things carefully. So wishing that something would work uh, doesn't work. Maybe applies to life, social life. Uh, family life, all of life in general. Um, and, and, and realizing that in-person is in-person and online is online. So, so that, that, that's something that, that we needs to, needs to be grasped. And when you are online, uh, maybe fewer of the sort of presentations uh, is, is a good idea. And, and the team leader role is, is way bigger, uh, even more bigger than, than normally. So from the what we can do uh, as a general organizers, when we are in person, we can uh, really keep an eye on the uh, the groups that how they work. Uh, the the biggest nightmare would be that one team or group would not, I mean, that would collapse. So so that especially when the others are thriving, and then when somebody one work group is not doing very well, there's a big risk that then people start uh, disappearing. Uh, they get sick and they they're not there uh, because the I mean that that's just how how things often 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 happens and and for that also it's it's very very important to understand that the personal learning and and the group results that they are not necessarily mutually inclusive so so that that group gets great results research sense doesn't mean that all the people have had a good experience. And this is the, the kind of balancing that, that is very important. And in person, this is something that as organizers, we can control uh, online. It's, it's way, way more, more difficult. And the major shift, if, I, if I'm thinking about it, from 19 to 21, when we went online, was that it became very group-based. And you can't help it. We kind of knew it. The, the sort of atmosphere changes. The dynamics changes. It gives you the possibility if if there's a, a very very good leadership that one group can push more towards the research side and be more um, how would I say uh, sort of a aiming for high sort of a higher research results, but but because then there's not that much of the comparative comparative element maybe in place between the groups, but then the learning from the other groups, uh, it's much more difficult online. So, so that the focus needs to be shifted a little bit, uh, if you understand then what I, what I mean by that. Now, uh, I'll, I'll start wrapping up. Uh, so if I would think about how to experiment further, well, one thing is that the, our concept is the in-person element is embraced. And uh, it's really important that the learning happens from the groups uh, in in between them. So so it is more than an individual group work, even when the the main focus is of course on the individual group that people really are committed for ten days, and 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 that's something that we we are pretty good at uh, getting happening when people are here in Helsinki. Uh, the, there was nothing wrong with the online element. Uh, the DH H21 hackathon was was I, I think it was a success. It was really good, uh, but it just needs to be remembered that it needs to be organized in a different way. It can't be treated as an extension of the in-person event. And we will have, for example, many of the groups uh, after the hackathon, they chose to pursue articles. They want to write it together. Uh, and that obviously happens online. One alternative uh, could be that you organize the hackathon partially so that the first days are in-person and the remaining would happen online when people know each other and, and, and so forth. But that would be something else than our hackathon. And, uh, and this is something that I've been thinking, I mean, that, that I'm, I'm pretty happy that with, the, with the concept that we have or the brand of our Helsinki hackathon uh, and, and with some other uh, collaborating universities, we've been thinking that we could maybe do a multi-sited uh, hackathon uh, that where people would work with the same data sets they are. I mean, for example, the parliament data set is really good. There are also other, other ones that, that you could have people working in different places with the, with the same ones, and then you organize some kind of a things to 
like presentations together and compare results and so forth. Uh, that that might, that might be doable. Uh, it wouldn't be easy though. Uh, but 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 that's something uh, that I've been thinking about remote collaboration when it comes to to our hackathon, for example. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, I think that that was enough. So thank you. Thanks very much, Miko. And uh, I wanted to pick up on two points that are maybe interrelated. The first one, um, you said the importance in a particularly in a, an educational perspective of focusing on the individual. And I wondered, do you as part of the hackathon series have some sort of self-reflection or something after at an individual level to understand what the people got out of it? And a second kind of related question, because you've been doing the DHH series for a while now, can you start thinking about um, impact? Because impact needs to be on a sort of a longer term. And I just wondered if there's anything that you've picked up that is the impact of the series as a whole. Thanks very much, Sally. Uh, <clears throat> so we we do take feedback extremely seriously, and uh, and uh, both from the experience of of the team leaders. So so every group has uh, usually at least two or maybe even three team leaders, and the way that we've been organizing is that we don't. We, earlier we've been taking team leaders who have not been part of the hackathon before so that there might be a team that that has a doesn't have any team leader who has been in the hackathon before and these days like i said we are quite conservative we don't want to do that it, it's about like developing the series in a way that that there's continuity from year to year because if you have a have a person uh that that or or a group that doesn't have any team leader who has been in the hackathon before so they then it, it there might be a that it gets detached but but anyway so so feedback both from the team leaders and also from the from the participants is extremely important for us uh so we we we've been uh developing iterating with the questions that we ask afterwards and and also then how how we how we do deal with that and also that that we keep we, we have people for like a normal hackathon, I don't go to a group. I, I'm observing the whole, I mean, obviously some general organization, but mainly trying to throughout the whole hackathon, see how the, the different groups develop and how the how how things go at that level. So so that is a is a very, very important uh learning throughout the hackathon to see how how things go as a Sort of a self-reflection, like like you 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 said uh, about the impact. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I I quite like the idea that we 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 get a lot of international uh, researchers and students who come uh, and join, and and that's a kind of way of making a impact overall. Uh, so when there, there's there's some. If I see people at conferences who who tell have been at the hackathon and and they they come to talk and say that that was a was a good experience and so forth, so so I think that's that's the kind of lasting impact that we can make. I don't know, da David or David David was there this year, so maybe he can tell how he felt. But <laughs> uh, it was actually one of the best experiences I had. Like ever it was the first thing I, i've done outside my university so i've never been on an erasmus on a longer project so i met a lot of people with uh, very similar uh ways of doing things and at the same time very dif different backgrounds and traditions so it was interesting to see how all of us converge on the same project and start to learn how we each one of us works together uh, and at the end, you actually have a project that you can present and you have a product that each and every one of us was proud of. So it was, it was a very nice experience. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, joint remote uh, uh, way of feeding back as well. Great. Thank you.
Um, yeah, thanks, Miko, for the lovely presentation. Um, I uh, am a great fan of your format as well, and was wondering um, if you also have any insights into how uh, research infrastructures could help you more. Um, yeah, maybe giving you more money could be a, an easy uh, answer, but I'm interested in more yeah content argument. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much. I mean, the the, the continued support uh, from Clarin and Daria. I mean, uh, without that, we would need to go back to finish finish uh, version, and and that I think everybody would lose lose a lot. So so we don't need more money, but we need money money that we 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 get. Uh, but but uh, so so that that is really really important. And but I think that that the way that we've been now starting that we are doing for example with parliament that how how we've been been doing the collaboration uh also i mean that that you developing the data us using it and and they're probably you could probably contact also the people in the parliament group and the leaders as well uh that that what were their experiences when you try to work with uh, cross many many data sets, which is not so easy always and and has has a lot of lot of issues itself, but but not only that that there could be also other other sort of a data or oriented ways of looking. That, for example, one thing that uh, with Daria we could develop is to think about uh, many. Uh, newspaper uh, materials that that people people are working with and 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 working groups within the, re, with respect to that both from the library perspective uh, so the data provider and and then the researchers at more at, at large uh, so so that how to keep clear continuity but so that that it develops further all the time because i i'm very much in favor that we we experimented some years that we we just took researchers saying that uh, maybe I even sent emails to some people that I knew that do you want to uh, bring in your own data set and do something just like a one off year uh, and and that's I mean that there can be very good things in that but I think that the continuity is the most important thing and uh, so so that 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 we we could negotiate with with different research infrastructures talk that 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 uh have like a couple of meetings and daria and clarin being the obvious ones that that have a little bit of a sort of a long term plan how to develop things and also what what the research infrastructures might get from us when we are now i i feel that we are in a fairly stable uh place i wouldn't go changing too much uh at the at the moment when things work quite nicely and 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 we can we can make this this work but but yeah i mean thinking thinking together uh and having the that when when some common data data is the center i think so so that how to work with that and 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 go forward and also uh with respect to the parliament, we have the, the Boyan. Boyan has been two years leading leading a group and uh, as one group leader, and and that that uh, when when you have this kind of personalities and uh, uh, very capable people who come come work together, it's 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 a great assets for everybody. I think. <laughs> In terms of small comments that uh, have popped up uh, in discussions on uh, previous papers, maybe uh, we could um, yeah, further improve uh, the hackathon with uh, always then submitting the final posters to the SSH open marketplace, small things, you know, that could help uh, the permanent visibility of your outcomes, or maybe you know you could have some some of the workflows or Jupyter notebooks published somewhere so that other people can try similar things uh, after reading about your work. And maybe yeah. a, a maybe another small comment about the newspapers. I would love to look at um, newspaper corpus from the resource families in Clarin, but also look at the same 
um, say, say like the Finnish um, newspaper corpus, but look at the humanities corpus. So you've got the linguistic corpus and you've got a, 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 the sort of same origin, but the humanities version of the newspapers. Uh, I'd love to see what could be done with them both together. And what, well, what, one thing, I mean, so, so that like I've been mentioning, that we are the the method method base is changing quickly. Of course, large language models and 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 so forth. But especially the image aspect of things. So so when we have also the newspapers would be that that really pushing more and more towards towards uh, working working with materiality. And, uh, and and doing that kind of things, so so that they're the the data processing and pre-processing, and 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 maybe getting those data sets further forward together with infrastructures might be might be something something that would be beneficial not only for the hackathon but but I think that the community at large I think there's more and more people who who would benefit from from working working with a with a kind of other aspect than, than I mean combining text with, with materiality like that I would put it. Hello everyone I'm here on behalf of uh, well myself and my colleague Martin Janssen and uh, we are going to we are going to focus on uh, infrastructure in pedagogy. So we are going to propose an infrastructure for scholars to create training data for NLP tools for their languages and domains. Uh, I will showcase some established NLP infrastructures to make it clear that there is no need for something new. And I will suggest how the DH community can exploit them to uh, immediately help disadvantaged researchers who can't uh, work with their own languages. Uh, it is a dry and technical topic, but I hope that it's going to be appealing in the context of ADHO uh, for its potential wide social impact. Uh, throughout the years, uh, we have been observing that the DH community, especially its organizations uh, and prominently at HO, are struggling with the implementation of diversity, inclusivity uh, principles, and they seem to be drifting away from scientific standards to some ideological activism. And uh, with this talk and our work, we want to induce a focus shift to practical research endeavors that will both benefit the field and remedy issues of scholarly marginalization associated with language or ethnic origin. So in practical terms, we offer speakers of under-resourced languages assistance with building a corpus to be integrated into an existing language technology infrastructure and thus leading to a new NLP tool. And uh, my perhaps most important legacy is that even one person per language can make a difference. Uh, I'm going to quickly remind you why NLP tools are important for at least text-related digital humanities. Uh, typical uh, tasks are uh, population of databases uh, <clears throat> based on unstructured text. So uh, this, this would be an example of, uh, uh, of a pro prosopographical database of socially significant personalities in the Austro-Hungarian empire. And in, based on the data, you can have uh, these graphs uh, and easily discover temporal and spatial relations between people, like could they interact with each other in, in real time. Uh, this graph is based on a database, like on the right-hand side of this slide, and that was semi-automatically semi extracted from the left-hand side, which is running text of some uh, old prosop prosopographical or biographical materials. Uh, so for, for that, they needed obviously named entity recognition and uh, lexical syn syntactic patterns. Another more modern example would be uh, a campaign by, by a migration organi organization who are collecting testimonies of, of migrants and how this organization uh, had helped them. So it was sort of interesting to find out which uh, organizations they were they were mentioning and from which people from which countries people were mentioning universities and from which countries people uh, they mentioned ISIS and stuff. So even such simple things you can't do without NLP. 
uh, to retrieve the origin and destination place in the migrant stories, you would have probably go to list, listing lemmas of verbs of motion or intention, and you uh, followed to by or syntactically governing a prepositional adjunct like to Lebanon, to you know, from from France, and uh, and location. This is done by NLP tools, which. Uh, rely on statistical models. And these statistical models are built for individual languages and then also uh, even domains within the languages. And here we touch the inclusion and diversity problem. When no appropriate tool is av available for the language you speak or investigate, you cannot do this kind of research at all. And given that these are state-of-the-art methods, when you cannot use them, you simply fall behind the current state-of-the-art. If you don't meet the current standard, it is irrelevant for most researchers in the field, and hence your publication acceptance is going to be meager. So this is not man-made man exclusion, and no diversity quotes can ever remedy it. This issue can only be remedied by equal access to language technologies for all DA researchers. Only then we can start considering other factors of disproportional representation. Uh, <clears throat> Not to, not to stick just to the languages. Uh, there, there is a simple example uh, of a different domain. So this is this is 19th century Czech poetry. Uh, Czech is a word, free word order language for, for which we, uh, we have to search trees rather than do sequential search because we have to abstract from the word order. Now in poetry, when this free word order combines with rhymes, you made it, make it even wilder. And there are patterns that only occur in poetry. And of course, a parser that is trained on newspapers or just nonfiction prose or even fiction prose would never capture them and would get something systematically wrong. What would remedy it would be a, a manually parsed corpus uh, and, and a model trained for this specific domain, which couldn't, wouldn't be a big thing since most things even the current model would get right, but you simply have to enrich it with, with the poetry specific stuff. Uh, I, like here, uh, there, there you see just uh, two, uh, two structures. It's uh, uh, one structure, uh, ours, words, glare is what glancing. Uh, and, and in the first case, the, uh, we, would, we, would never, we would never put uh, the, an, uh, a genitive, nominal genitive attribute before before the actual thing that, that it modifies uh, in prose, but it's very frequent in poetry. And then when you want when when you want to extract like subjects of sentences and, and stuff, then you will you will simply not not capture uh, not capture it properly. Uh, so what uh, would help? Concerted efforts of researchers and for researchers. Uh, to create such tools within several years. Uh, we are not, take, not, not talking about decades. I think uh, concentrated effort of, of a few years could, could do for, for each language or months for, for language. Uh, we just need to supply training data for the domains and languages in sufficient volume and quality. And now let me introduce the Universal Dependencies Universe. Uh, which is an already established infrastructure in the NLP world, uh, and it's ready to use by the DH community. So there's, uh, you can see that the universal dependencies already have captured many, many languages. Uh, for, for many languages, the UD, UD tree bank is the first resource that, that, that exists for, for the given language at all. So you see that it has momentum. Uh, and uh, it, so, so the, there, there's a semi-formal infrastructure or community about, about, uh, around this universal dependencies uh, endeavor. Uh, they create annotation guidelines, uh, they maintain them, there is a production workflow that anyone can join, uh, and they, they maintain and publish, regularly republish the annotated reference corpora. And now the, the, uh, this, uh, this is interesting on it, uh, that, that has its customers. Uh, these corpora are regularly taken up by, by developers of NLP tools. 
Uh, one we have at the department where I and Mar Martin come from, the UD pipe, but I am not speaking and selling you, like for, for UD pipe, selling you the UD pipe. Uh, Spacey is the same thing. They also use these models. So it is really just univer universal, uh, useful for, for everyone. Um, so what it takes is a willing annotator who learns uh, who learns the annotation guidelines or adapts them to a language when there's uh, there, uh, when when he or she is the first person to to process that language and then uh, makes it uh, makes a, a sufficient volume and uh, insufficient quality and passes it to uh, to this workflow. There are already some. A range of generally recommended annotation tools, some of which are easy and enjoyable to use, like Inception, which is the former web anno, uh, or at our institute, we like uh, the Orange Public Convolu Editor, but it's really a matter of choice. And then any person can grab such a tool, uh, make a tree bank and release, uh, and updates are released every six months. So, so at, at the longest, after six months, your your corpus is going to be up to to to, to be part of that pipeline. Uh, the tree bank the tree banks are versioned on the universal dependencies GitHub account and our the snapshots are released uh, in the Linda Claria repository. Uh, in theory, any D8 scholar should be already doing this on their own, but we still think that there are some discouraging obstacles. Like this is a new community with its jargon. Uh, the annotation manual may be unclear and man, one, uh, one might need someone to, to discuss it with. So simply put, it could be a good start with a dedicated training and a mentor counseling when one gets stuck leading the project to an accomplishment. And at the same time, uh, we are ready to do this. Uh, and at the same time, uh, interactions of this kind will help us to create targeted, targeted online tutorials with, uh, for, for these specific people. Uh, now, uh, let me tell you what the workflow looks like afterwards. So when the researcher creates a corpus, uh, then it, uh, it goes published and, and uh, then uh, it can it is grabbed up by the developers and here is uh, here is UD pipe uh, um, a multilingual parser trained on the UD corpora. Uh, when you contribute a valid purpose, the UD pipe includes it in their language models for UD pipe, which follow tightly each uh, update uh, release update of, of the corpora. So so in six nine months you will you will have your 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 tool ready. Uh, as I said, I presented UD pipe, but anyone can uh, create their own parser with it or just uh, the uh, competing parsers. So this is the Turkish example uh, from Hugging Face uh, that's made for Spacey and, and uh, in the guts of it, like the, the referential cor corpus is, uh, is the Turkish UD corpus. Uh, now, uh, admittedly, this linguistic annotation is not a very satisfying endeavor. Uh, you and as a scholar, you would like doubly hate to annotate texts you would normally not be interested in. The linguists before they just grabbed newspapers and Wikipedia and they annotated it being you know paid by hour. Uh, we are aware of that being a nonsensical scenario for for digital humanists. Uh, so we just assume that you have you want to annotate texts that are part of digital editions or or complicated stuff with a lot of TEI. XML encoded uh, annotation before, and you would hate to destroy it, and you would like to integrate your careful manual annotation into it. Uh, prototypically, NLP works with plain texts on input, uh, but there is a, at least one tool that we know of, that's Martin's Statoc, uh, where you can uh, where you can work with both uh, both the annotations you've already had and add, add this linguistic annotation on top of it. Either uh, working inside Taytalk or what, what we would advise, uh, exporting it to, uh, to a format that, that is accepted by, by the NLP annotation tools. And then uh, Martin just secures to get it, uh, get it when, when you upload it, it gets integrated into the TI XML. Uh, 
so in the figure, you see uh, you, you see a snapshot of Taytalk. There's there's a manuscript with facsimile uh, different. Uh, different layers of uh, standardization in in the digital edition, and on on top of that, uh, you can uh, uh, you can edit each token uh, what's inside, like the part of speech and, and and the things that the NLP is interested in. So this is what what you could do. The same thing would go with uh, with a sound file, with so we would not lose the the, the sound tracking. Uh, at the same time, uh, well, actually, we were pretty surprised at uh, at a summer school that we taught Martin and, and myself uh, that uh, so many scholars focus on how to get annotations into a corpus, but they sort of care less how to use them. Actually, uh, focus has been like searching the corpus corpora uh, with annotation seems to be in, um, unpopular and, and simply not, not, not a deal and, and we well, not, not a big deal and we we just think this is uh, we, we can't understand that simply because because that's that's a good way of in, uh, information extraction uh, just to, to make corpus searches so uh, to uh, decrease the hurdles for for this linguistic research uh, Taytalk has uh, corpus query language integrated right into uh, in, in your corpus, so you can learn to query the corpus uh, right on, on the stuff you are, you are interested in. Um, we have already some history. I've mentioned I've mentioned a summer school. Martin had taught summer schools like that before, uh, and we also within uh, within. Um, a project called uh, Computational Literary Studies Infrastructure. Uh, we host, like our institutions, uh, host uh, fellows for transnational access fellowships for three months. And uh, my department has uh, hosted four people so far, uh, three of whom were doing something, well, two, two were building strange corpora, like a Turkish corpus, or, or we had, uh, we had uh, uh, this Irish bardic poetry uh, corpus, so that was 17th century, uh, 17th century uh, Irish, and it took three months to Dr. Franzen to uh, annotate 1,000 tokens, which doesn't seem much, but at the same time, he learned the entire, uh, he learned the, the entire scheme, uh, he made sure that it would be consistent with the annotation of the modern Irish corpus, which is pretty big and should be pivoted, sort of. And uh, he documented his, his adaptations. So that, that was a pretty nice piece of work. And it was even consistent with the corpus of even older Irish with which it could be merged afterwards. Uh, and so we think that when we have an established infrastructure ready to accommodate, like, and and, and, uh, and they produce any number of trading data in any language uh, that is just not known among the scholars, or maybe they're waiting for someone else to make their hands dirty with the data. We would just encourage them to do that because there is no one else who would do this. Uh, and uh, I would like to set an example with the OCR and HTR models. When you when you digitize texts with with transcribers, it sort of feels natural that you share your models, right? So why not doing it, do, doing the same thing with with the NLP part? Also, when you use NLP uh, NLP tools, you would like to evaluate how well it performs. You can find out by annotating a thousand tokens that the tool you have at your hands already is good enough for what you want to do, and then it's also a good part of your publication to say, hey. I'm pretty sure that what I found has decent precision and recall. Or I didn't have the time to annotate something, and I know that my that, that the error rate is this and this, so I'll return to, return to this in the future. Um, well, so now to the that, that would be the technical part of thing. Just make people annotate with with what, uh, how much. And we offer a training block with morphology without syntax. It turned out during uh, during the summer school that uh, morphology is much more uh, easier to perceive for for people with no linguistic training, because even though uh, the 
um, logic of the morphology annotation is the same for all languages. Still, the concrete usage of, of the labels uh, pretty much draws on the on the traditional grammars, school grammars of that given language. So people grasp it really, really fast. While with syntax, then, then uh, people come from different scholarly traditions. Uh, uh, most of most of them uh, didn't do linguistics because they hated syntax. So so it's uh, it's sort of more sensitive to to push people into syntax. But we think that even even when you have just morphologically tagged corpora's uh, corpora to uh, to create NLP tools for in like the first generation of it, that it enables you very powerful searches and and just makes the overall situation much better. Uh, as you saw in my Czech poetry example, one does not always have to start from, from scratch. Uh, often, uh, often it helps a lot uh, when we pre-tag the language, uh, the new language with the with language close enough or, or a different domain. And, and already that gets many things right. And also we can gradually enrich the pre-processing model with the finished annotating batches outside of the official pipeline. And that will again, help the annotator because uh, the pre-processing will become, become more and more precise. Uh, so uh, now what we, what we would need to, uh, <laughs> for, uh, fr from the community, uh, we seek trainees and contributors of the, uh, of the corpora. Uh, we promise to give them our time and, and effort. But we, we, we badly need to frame it into, uh, into budgeted events, like something from Daria, or if you, if you think of your classes and, and uh, could think of having it as a, as a credited course with, within virtual mobility, that would help a lot. So we, we are approaching it bottom up. Uh, start. We, we would like to start with a few dedicated people or groups and, and just uh, evolve this into something that is going to be big and sustainable, but we have to start somewhere. We started with a summer school and, and a few scholarships, but now it's time for small groups. Um, I was looking at teaching uh, teaching schemes, budgeting schemes, granting schemes at my university. I, I'm just listing it for for, for your reference, if something rings a bell with you, then, then it might be a good start that you ask at your uni university if we couldn't perhaps start a common, a common online course or something, something like that. Uh, so, and if you find my talk relevant, you just look for matching collaboration schemes at your site. Uh, another thing is that uh, as a researcher, you need academic credits and uh, you would like to have it for even creative, creating the corpus. So it would be very nice, and that's like outside of my and Martin's control, uh, to have a publication platform venue, uh, something like uh, the the LREC, the Language and Resource Evaluation, uh, Language Resources and Evaluation Conference, used to be twenty years ago. Twenty years ago, uh, annotation was the big thing. People were going to that huge conference to exchange their routines on annotation, uh, discuss how many people they had annotating, uh, how they measured inter-annotator agreement and stuff. With this, you can't make a publication anymore because it's, it's just, you, know, you, have to, you have to apply those standards and, and that's it. Uh, but for, for digital humanists and for the weird domains they are working with, it is a new thing. And while they cannot hope on good publications at LREC, it would be good if this were just emerged inside in, in, the, uh, in the index journals like digital scholarship in the humanities or wh whatever, something that counts. I don't know how it is in your countries, but in uh, our grant providers basically just count uh, publications indexed in web of science. I am not a proponent of this, but I can't control this. So if, if you're in the same shoes, then, then we probably should do something about it rather than saying this is not the you know, way to do it. We have to do it, otherwise we are not appointed anymore. So rather let's, let's lobby for, for publication venues until the situation changes. Uh, you can see that uh, with the, so so this is uh, this is the language resources and evaluation conference throughout the years, like two decades. 
you can you can also see that uh, so the, the size means uh, mentions uh, <clears throat> mentions of uh, <clears throat> mentions of of languages uh, in papers paper titles yes. uh, and and in the corpora building decade uh, even small languages like my uh, like, like Czech were big. So, so it wasn't, and you know, we are not a rich nation, anything. It was more a matter of people caring. Uh, and, and now, now it expanded substantially. Only the, the articles are not, not anymore so much about corpora, but about tools being built on very small data, adapting something to, to, to a different language and stuff. So, so it would be all, you see that that the NLP people are interested in many languages, but what they lack is the training resources, and and that's the that's where we have to step in if we want to use these tools properly. Um, yeah, uh, I have some favorites who I <laughs> whom I would want to uh, address more, but it's still very immature, very, very at the beginning. Uh, that's the multilingual DH group uh, founded by Alice Horvat and Marusha Bharkevich. Uh, and I also heard or from them, I got forwarded an email uh, with, with uh, a multilingual DH ad hoc group being, uh, being set up. Uh, and this ad hoc group, uh, interestingly, is not concerned about uh, papers being published in as many languages as possible, but uh, focuses on research being done on as many languages as possible. So that's like the, the relevant part of the of the matter as well. Uh, so yeah, I'm just mentioning it that that it exists, and uh, let's uh, let's see whether whether. We are, there's going to be any uh, synergy with this. I would like to conclude with you know, throwing down the gauntlet to ad hoc to support a truly inclusive effort with dissemination and fellowships for the spearheaders of equal access to language technologies. Uh, I would say that uh, those whose languages already have good tools are the privileged ones, uh, which typically is English. Uh, <clears throat> And they like get a snowball benefits from from contributions by other inter by international researchers, uh, and that we clearly have a different baseline for researchers in many other languages with no or poor tools available. So let's give them their scientific credit for starting with creating the technical uh, prerequisites for their their uh, successors' scientific work. And it, they don't have to spend their lifetimes on that. It, it's good enough if they spend half a year and, and uh, then something can be, then, then we see results already. So uh, thank you for your attention. And I hope that, well, um, if you have any questions or, or any time, just drop me an email. Thank you. Hi, hi Sylvie, it's nice to meet you in person. <laughs> um, yeah, so to use that cliche term, this is more of a comment than a question. Um, but I wanted to mention, so you were talking there about um, trying to advocate for a new way of evaluating research and particularly, as you were saying, that I think it was it weather science, is that right, that they only look at in terms of bibliometrics and what have you? Um, I wanted to point you to, in case you hadn't heard of it, Kawara. Um, I can't remember exactly what the acronym stands for, but basically it's um, about um, additional assessments. But if we're looking at, um, if you're looking at ways to try and push them towards that, that might be somewhere to start. Um, we are all on two, three year termed contract. We don't have the capacity to do that. I mean, all this, I understand the point. We are getting the point. But by, you know, pushing us to saying we are not playing by the rules we find, we find unjust, you are just killing us. Um, so, so thank you very much for the introduction of the platform. And I actually found a small language uh, progress that I needed. 
And I have a question that, is it possible to contact the contributors up on the platform? Because I really want to get in touch with them and ask more questions. Well, it's they, they are on GitHub, right? So so you send them an, uh, a, a, a GitHub issue and uh -huh. that, that's it probably. Uh, I don't think it, it works like a you know, social network or anything. It's it's very dry. They they they, they discuss where to put a preposition. <laughs> I have just a small addition. I really like your appeal at the end of the talk. And in addition to your initiatives that you are identifying, there is a very interesting uh, series of workshops that. Uh, um, Paul Spence from King's College London is organizing. Um, Disrupting Digital Monolingualism was one of the workshops that uh, he uh, did with exactly the same goals as you. And uh, with a very similar goal, he also um, is running the Modern Languages Open, uh, open Journal. So maybe this could That's be a good nice. value. It's called Modern Languages Open. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't know about that. Maybe to follow up on Daria's comment, Paul Spence also um, at the um, UK and Ireland DH um, Association. It was set up a couple, well, they had their first event the other day. They've got multilingual DH in the UK and Ireland. So they've got a special interest group there. But I wondered a bit like, um, uh, the colleague just here said, how can you contact and the Git, you said the GitHub. Do you think there is room to sort of have some sort of community around the people oh, doing maybe things? Maybe I misunderstood your question. Uh, the, 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 the small language, like, like when you want to create a corpus, then I was, I was just thinking about this, but this multilingual uh, special group, uh, I think that you have to go to the Daria sites and, and uh, find, Good that you made this clear for me. Uh, the, 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 there, are, there are two email addresses, and I think that's it. And, and then there you can register for, for a mailing list. And as I understood, uh, it's, it's all very fresh. They, they had like one meeting or two. Yeah. Okay, thank you. But I was wondering if there is an opportunity, you said the GitHub people, um, all the people who are doing the um, universal dependencies on the different languages, the best way to communicate is through GitHub yes. push and pull. But I just wondered if it would widen the community if, I don't know, perhaps a collaboration between Daria and Clarin to create a community to, if people are not sure about whether they want to do, to do that, to get more people involved. Uh, well, so what, they are always happy about new data. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they are they are like technical people who uh, let your data go through a validation test, mm -hmm. and when it passes, they are happy. And when it doesn't pass, uh, they just don't care. They won't tell you why. You... <laughs> so it's more, it's more getting the people to prepare the the data on. Yeah, the, yeah. So people on the GitHub are the people validating the data. Yeah, they, they they're also doing the, the you know making the data. So so if you if you annotate well even older Irish than Theodorus Franzen did, uh, then then and and you know that he was working on it. Then I think the easiest thing is dropping him a, him an email yes. or or go to GitHub. And, and drop him and maybe even his personal email because he might you know not be interested in that project anymore and just ask him i mean there's no no other special question just how we can because you said at the beginning you were talking about it just takes one person for one language to make start making a difference and i just wondered if we could raise the profile to have new students or something to to start yeah wanting well, to prepare well, this it isn't in place and and uh, yeah. as i said me and martin uh, yeah. martin is developing ttalk i am working pretty closely with with the universal dependencies people like i i have one of the founders sitting next to my my room almost uh so so in in those terms it is easy and and also i'm i'm a digital humanist i'm not a computer scientist mm -hmm. so so i sort of know that many many things that they take for granted are difficult so i don't want to brag but i think that i would be a good you know a good person to start with yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if we can generate we can push in your direction 
we, we can certainly try and do more, but I think that they take care of the fact that there is community around them pretty well all of yeah, the week. Yeah. They organize a lot of events, uh, workshops. They have very good uh, guides to, to take you through the process. And uh, within these cost actions, they're pretty active okay. on the networking mm -hmm. part, the bar seam and what's the new one now. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of this going on already within the community. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we just need to get in, in yes. touch with that. I, I, to I advertise heard. a little. Yeah, yeah exactly. You need to, if you in theory you don't need anyone at all. You just you just read the manual and and go yeah. ahead. If you feel intimidated by that, then myself and Martin have been teaching this <laughs> as many other people right for, for God's sake we don't claim any monopoly but, but I, I just want to say there's someone ready to help you get going if, if you want to create a purpose or if you have students who would whom you would like to push to, to doing that then then uh, we've already taught something for 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 EU plus and that went surprisingly well sort of so so I could imagine a model like this as well brilliant thank you Beautiful. So if we're finally set up and ready. Uh, hi, my name is Theodore Manning. Um, I would first like to say, pardon my appearance, as we all know, it is horrendously warm today. Um, and also before I continue, I would like to first thank uh, Juliana for moving mountains so that we were able to be here to present with you all today. Um, and I would like to thank my colleagues, um, uh, Alejandro Napolitano and um, uh, Genia Lucan for being able to be here so last minute. Uh, so I would like to introduce you all to the Evil Lab. So uh, who are we? So we are the Evaluating Variations in Language Lab. Our PI, who is in the audience here, is uh, Dr. Patrick Hula. Um, and we are a lab primarily focused on stylometry, so writing style and, and such like. Um, so today's team, who we have with us, uh, is myself. I'm a linguist. We have uh, Zhenya, who is a psycholinguist, and um, Alex, who is a computer scientist and statistician. You might also hear me refer to him as Alejandro, he goes by both. So what do we do? Uh, so stylometry is kind of this combination of humanities, CS, statistics. It's this wonderful marriage of all of these things that make for a very good digital humanities practice. Uh, so over the last 13 years, we've had uh, six grant projects. Um, we've had software development developing um, something called JGAP, the Java Graphical Authorship Attribution Program. Um, we have done plagiarism detection as well as deception detection, which is essentially like uh, detecting when people are lying, being untruthful. So we've also had some student driven <laughs> projects, which is a real highlight of our lab. So we've had um, GPT detection as is so common right now. Um, we've had co-authorship studies, um, authorship attribution, of course, um, as we mentioned, this is stylometry. So what else are you going to do? Um, and then today's topic is Project Map Lemon, which is my baby. So I would like to introduce you to Map Lemon. So here's our, here is the framework here. So the, the idea of deception detection ultimately led to Map Lemon. Um, to detect lies, we needed a corpus of truthful language to compare against. Um, we needed a corpus of like naturally elicited digital writing uh, for North American English speakers. Um, a lot of the corpora that are out there tend to be data scraped from things like Twitter, um, and that's not the naturally uh, elicited language that we're looking for, that's uh, slang. So we needed a baseline corpus. Um, we had been looking at this thing called the HCRC map task corpus, which, while beneficial, it is only available on CD-ROM, which is uh, a problem, as you can probably imagine. Um, furthermore, it is... Um, it is phonetically based, so there are all of like these speech components and the um, map that they have drawn is much more vague than ours in terms of um, its objects that will elicit linguistic variation, though I'm getting ahead of myself, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, so we chose to use the uh, PB&J framework. So the PB&J framework uh, was designed uh, by Dr. Yula, uh, the idea being um, 
that people write a recipe and that recipe um, can elicit different linguistic variants. So the name being PB and J, you might, for example, call the J jam or jelly or preserves. Why not? PB and P, that's possible too. Uh, so we decided to use this framework with, you know, lemonade, hence the name Mac Lemon. Uh, so we decided we would have uh, our participants do two experiments. So first, uh, they would uh, give directions on a map and then uh, provide a recipe for lemonade. Uh, so first of all, we had to determine demographic uh, characteristics for the corpus. Um, it was not necessarily intentional. Uh, but gender ended up being a focus of this corpus. Um, when we were creating the demographic survey, um, I kind of wanted to write a wrong that I saw in a lot of surveys that just said gender, male, female. It's like, we have enough data on this already. Let's do something interesting. Let's give people more options. Let's include trans people and non-binary people. Uh, because that gender binary, as you can see, is done to death. Um, so what ended up happening is when we were analyzing this corpus, we found that it appeared that uh, transgender people um, are in writing style more similar to each other first, and then secondly, most similar to their gender rather than their sex assigned at birth. Um, and now our question with Project Map Lemon is, can transgender people be distinguished in writing style from cisgender people? Um, and this also corroborates current uh, research being done um, in the field of transgender linguistics, um, like the theory of the transgender accent, uh, as posed by uh, Lal Zaman just a couple of years ago. So, like I mentioned, um, we have this uh, experimental design, the questionnaire, um, a lovable character named Chad Lemon Lover, who really needs your help to find his lemonade stand because he's very stupid and needs many details in order to get there. And then we had our um, recipe and then the demographic information, all of the IRB things and stuff at the bottom. Because we, um, when we were eliciting these things, we wanted people to feel naturally like they were taking the survey rather than um, biased towards very formal writing by filling out the survey first. So our materials, um, we were largely working with free things uh, because as you can tell, student-driven project usually does not equal funding. Um, so our materials for data collection were uh, Google Forms, um, and currently we're also using uh, Prolific, uh, which is not free. Um, and I would just like to say thank you to my university for um, giving me the Provost Digital Initiatives grant um, so that I am able to fund some of these, um, these participants that were recruiting via Prolific. If you're not familiar with Prolific, which I'm finding fewer people are, I'm, I'm quite shocked by this. It's a better alternative to Mechanical Turk, if you're familiar with that. They pay people more uh, and they have better demographic selection and just higher quality responses in general. Um, Prolific also has really good security protocols. So I can't see any of the names. I can't see any email addresses. They are all um, done in internal numbers within the prolific system so that it's all, I can't see anything. Um, and then for our technical analysis, uh, as I had previously mentioned, uh, JGAP, the Job Graphical Authorship Attribution Program, essentially the way that works with this analysis is that we have put in um, the, I suppose to briefly explain JGAP, it uh, consists of two different sections and I apologize for no visuals here. That is a, 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 what's the word? Well, let's use mistake. That's a close enough word. Mistake on my part. Um, but so you can enter an author that is unknown, quote unquote, and then other authors to compare them against. So say if you have your known authors in our case as say we've got trans men, trans women, and cis women, and then we put as an unknown author cis men, then we can compare how similar cis men are to those other genders. So now I believe I would like to hand it off to Alejandro if you're ready. Of course I am. Hello, everyone. The 
as the slide says, the project needed our combined expertise, and we could not have come together without a lab. We tried to brainstorm these projects together and try anything. Could you please go to the next slide? Uh, following one. Uh, so this, this evil lab, it's based in Pittsburgh at Duquesne University, where uh, it's my alma mater. It was founded in 2010 with an NSF grant for developing JGAP. Um, the NSF, for those of you who don't know, is the National Science Fund. Um, so before the pandemic, members were originally Duquesne University students or graduates. But after the pandemic, this has changed. The lab members are mostly residents of the United States. But apart from a few members who are affiliated with two universities in Pittsburgh, the majority are spread along the East Coast. Uh, the lab has also uh, become more diverse after the pandemic. Um, it is much more accessible because during COVID, we transitioned to an online modality for our weekly meetings. We formed a Discord server uh, and we generally encourage collaboration and interaction between lab members. Uh, next slide, please. So the Dr. Yola, he based the lab policies on the clear lab book and they can be summed up as follows. No blame assessment, meaning we don't fault people. We don't attack people for their mistakes. If it happens on your watch, it's your fault. And luckily, we always have Dr. Yola on watch to take care of us. Uh, we deal with problems on a going forward basis, meaning that no matter what mistakes happen, we learn how to prevent their recurrence instead of dwelling on them. Everybody is respected equally and treated as a professional, regardless of their skills. Uh, every skill set is valuable, and we are here to develop those skills. So next, please. These are just generally the grant projects uh, that were briefly mentioned earlier by Teddy, some of them. Um, but these, the important part is that this funding is largely unavailable for student projects, except uh, sometimes we get some money, for example, for Map Lemon. Uh, Teddy can better talk to that, uh, can better attest to that, sorry. Yeah, um, absolutely. If you if you want me to go ahead, uh, yes, please. Yeah, so um, we were very grateful for um, in Map Lemon's pilot stages. Uh, we got uh, a few hundred dollars from the lab from a mysterious source that I can't say. Um, I remember off of the top of my head, and I don't know whose credit card it came off of, but whoever it is, I owe them my life. Um, yeah, so we had, I think, a total of 600 USD um, to put towards uh, getting the first, um, I suppose, phase and a half would be most accurate of um, participants for um, our corpus. Thanks, Teddy. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, a little bit more detail about JGAP. It provides several different functionalities. So canonicizing text means putting it in canonical form. You can, for example, remove punctuation, remove alphanumeric characters, uh, unify the, the case to send everything to lowercase, and so on. Um, it is the product of over a decade of work by several generations of programmers, myself included, and we are constantly evolving and adding new methodologies and fixing bugs as they, they appear. Uh, next, please. So pre-pandemic, the lab was completely centralized at Duquesne. We were all Duquesne students. There were always student projects, but a lot of it was focused on grant projects, especially when students were paid for their work at the lab. And we had very little expertise outside of mathematics and computer science because the lab is... Uh, well, Dr. Yola, he teaches at the Faculty of Mathematics and Computer Science. And all meetings were in person. Next, please. So after the pandemic, uh, the main changes came through word of mouth recruitment, which we still rely on, sadly. Uh, we recruit our own replacements and 
the word of mouth got to amazing people like Teddy and Genia. Uh, this allowed for the undertaking of much more diverse projects and us transcending Duquesne University to find non-computer science members who are interested in carrying out their different projects. So for example, in this project, I took a support role with my knowledge of computer science. And the project was quite decentralized with Teddy being the, the main driver who inspired us all with his idea. Uh, so that is how we make up for a largely lacking infrastructure. The lab is student driven. We meet online. We have again, the discord server and are constantly brainstorming ideas. Uh, so we proofread each other's works. We pitch ideas for constructive criticism and help. Uh, Dr. Yola takes a largely hands-off approach at managing our activities and roles. So we are allowed to explore our interests and do our own research. Uh, next, please. So now lab members are not on payroll. However, we have published 40 plus conference papers in the last, what, um, several years, 11 published journal articles, and 50% of this output was achieved after the pandemic. So what, in the past uh, two years or so, uh, thanks to these changes in this online modality that the pandemic brought. Students in the lab have generally had great success in going on to industry, and now more of us are starting to go into academia and specifically DH. Uh, more please, uh, next please. Uh, so Teddy, could you talk the, about the obstacles to your research? Yeah, so um, some of the obstacles to my research, first of all, um, there's a very uh, wide variety of expertise required here. Um, I'm just one person. I don't know if you noticed, um, but I have wonderful people like Alex and Jenya to help me, but these are PhD students with their own projects and things to do. Um, and I am just a master's student with this as kind of my, my main driver. So um, I end up taking the reins on this a lot of the time. Um, there are also uh, things that I would like to explore with Math Lemon that I cannot explore until I have an expert um, in, the, in the field to help me out, um, such as I would love to explore uh, neurodivergence um, and how that works uh, with speech, especially in connection to uh, transgender people. Uh, I cannot do that. I do not have someone who will let me get the IRB approval to ask those kinds of questions of people. Um, then there's the lack of funding. Um, that grant that I got has already about ran out. Um, I've been able to get two rounds of respondents from that. Um, and I'm hoping that maybe I can squeeze just a little bit more out of it, but I'm still currently begging for money at any corner. Um, and that, that has been a major uh, problem for us. That's probably the the biggest problem. Then um, live participants. Um, originally, when we started this project, it's like the, the pandemic had really just uh, taken off. I believe we had just come back to school campuses, so it would have been fall of 2020, which is shocking to me still to this day that we decided that was an okay time to go back to things. Um, but so we could not have live participants, we couldn't elicit speech, so we had to do things with digital writing, which ended up being a, uh, a fantastic idea, but it was still um, difficult to recruit people initially, especially uh, during phase one um, with just the pilot, which I'm so glad we did a pilot uh, because it was only in phase two that we decided uh, to get prolific participants because phase one was A, word of mouth, and B, Reddit. Uh, do not put your surveys on Reddit. Uh, you will not get human people for the most part. Yes, I am very good at detecting bots now. JGAP is also very good at doing this. Uh, but generally speaking, it's like when they're writing a recipe, they'll say, take 16 lemons and grate the zest and grate the zest and grate the zest. <laughs> Or um, because they can't see the map that they are supposed to give directions on, it it it, it sounds just demented. Um, 
So getting actual human people was uh, a challenge very much in the beginning. Uh, and then again, with the digital data collection, we had this whole change of workspace, this whole change of what we were supposed to do. Um, initially, when I had thought of this project, I was like, oh, I could borrow the phonetics lab from one of my professors. And then it was like, ah, no, you can't do that. We're not doing that anymore, especially not talking into microphones at that point in time. Um, so we kind of had to just readapt our idea of what this experiment would look like in the first place. Next slide for you, Alex. Yeah, so before I go into this slide, I would like to add that these remote modes of collaboration brought people like Teddy to us. Duquesne University is a very white university. It's a Catholic school. And so without this remote collaboration, we would not have had the many perspectives we have. Now we have we are members, we have Jewish, Asian, people of uh, color, the people from obviously diverse expertise, uh, but we can still do better, I believe. The issue is that we are not affiliated with any research infrastructure. Uh, the obvious increase in efficiency for us would be to have a solid infrastructure, and we don't have the money for that either. As I said before, right now, we depend on word of mouth and recruiting our own replacements. The U.S. lacks an equivalent of Dario or Clarin, uh, making it hard for the lab to function within a broader context, except through grant and grant projects and di uh, direct collaboration between universities. Uh, I should say that efficiency is not a value of the lab. Our well-being and learning experience are the real priorities because we are not paid for this work we do it as a work of passion and as such we support and inspire each other but we are really lacking in uh in external support that would make our projects uh have a better reach and be able to interact with other ongoing projects next slide please so while the lab by itself does pretty well, I mean, we have published a lot, especially after the pandemic, uh, we could greatly benefit from participating within a broader research infrastructure. Uh, we really need additional training and experience that I think could be achieved with workshops and summer schools, such as those held by Daria and Clarine. Uh, the exchange of ideas that happens within research infrastructure and the events they sponsor would help us find more projects to work on and collaborate at a larger scale. One of the main weaknesses of our lab is how isolated we are. Um, we still rely on word of mouth. If we were affiliated with a research infrastructure, uh, we would have even more diverse expertise, be able to find more inspiration for new projects, and more importantly, attract new members. Uh, furthermore, we could openly share our research within a research infrastructure, and that would help us have more reach, better impact, and contextualizing our input, or rather our output, in the different subfields fields of DH. Next, please. So, in turn, we could contribute to existing databases by, for example, sharing our corpora, except obviously those obtained under an IRB. We could additionally run workshops of our own so that ben researchers can benefit from software such as JGAP and potentially contribute to it or come to us with your needs so that we can change JGAP and add new functionalities to suit the, the needs that arise as technology and different projects develop and new knowledges are incorporated. Uh, we believe that the EVL lab has a lot to offer to research infrastructures and adopting an open science approach would help expand our horizons and become an important contributing member in the DH community. Thank you very much. Uh, next. Questions? Yes, uh, Vicky? Yeah. Um, your project sounds really, really interesting and I'd love to have a chat with you about it more at some point during this week, if that's possible. Um, thank you very much for this really interesting presentation. I wanted to ask you about your project, the Map Lemon project. Um, so many questions, but I'll go with. Um, 
When you say that you're you're looking at um, transgender people, is that just transgender people? Or does that also include non-binary and gender fluid people? Or is that going to add even more variation and make it more complicated? Oh, my apologies. I thought I specified um, transgender and non-binary people. Oh, I probably wasn't listening. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Um, and in, in preliminary results, what have you found so far? Uh, so as I mentioned previously, uh, we have found that First and foremost, uh, transgender people um, have a tendency to write more like each other um, than um, they do. Um, pardon. So they write most like most similarly uh, to each other. And secondly, most similarly to their gender. And then finally, they are most dissimilar to their sex assigned at birth. If I could add. Oh. If I could follow up, the other thing I think that we've discovered, and um, uh, Mr. Manning will support me on this, is that non-binary people are very rare on prolific. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, non-binary people are so prolific on prolific. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite the opposite. The problem that we're having is particularly uh, people who are assigned male at birth and who are transgender or non-binary um, due to sociological stuff. They have a less tendency to be out um, or comfortable taking surveys like this. Um, so that has been um, very, very difficult to, to get data on those people. Hi, thanks very much to all of you for your presentations and great to see how COVID and everything, how the remote participation changed things as well. I wanted to come back to the um, uh, discussion about research infrastructures and, um, and, and sort of your lack of infrastructure, uh, let's say, uh, and to see how we could collaborate. So I think, I don't know, uh, Karina are in the room. You probably- think you asking the same question. <laughs> But yeah, what is it that you could benefit from research infrastructures was my question. Mm -hmm. But for example, when you say we are sad that we don't have any, mm -hmm. what is it that you would like to get from them? Because maybe we could already be helping as is, or maybe you are yeah, expecting too much from research infrastructures. Yeah. And even when you do get them, you won't be very satisfied. <laughs> It looks, like, it looks like Patrick. Patrick's sitting there, like, no, 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 no. no. I'm not touching this one with the barge poles. <laughs> All right. Um, give, I can, this I one can take this one if you'd like. This, this, this is Jenna. Jenna? Yes. Hi. Um, so there's a few things that we could immediately benefit from. One of them is just language expertise, because one of the things that um, one of the other big focuses of the lab is um, under-researched languages, um, specifically to create and train data sets for um, authorship attribution. So some languages obviously are very well-researched and, and used and documented and everybody does them. And some languages are just substantially underrepresented. Um, research infrastructures and mass collaborations can throw in language expertise that we as a lab don't have. Um, another thing that we could very easily benefit from is um, topic expertise. So um, and and idea generation. So, for example. We are currently engaged in a very large deception detection project, which is um, difficult. It is a challenging project that we don't really have a good handle on. And it would be useful to us, I think, to see how other people would approach it statistically. So if somebody decides, hey, run this test and then, you know, rationalize it, and present the results, that would be very handy. So these are a couple of examples I can think of just immediately offhand. Um, that, please don't. All right, and that's that's my two cents here. Great, and maybe what I wanted to add is that, well, we have cooperative, Daria have cooperating partnerships and we've just got starting to develop cooperating partnerships. We've got one in Boulder, Colorado. We've also got Princeton. So. Um, at least the Princeton colleague is here somewhere and Quinn Dombrowski has also done quite a lot of work. So maybe it's interest in, 
in understanding what happened after Project Bamboo in the, in the States and, and to see how we could do that. So maybe we could explore those. And I was thinking, is it JGAP? Um, we have the Social Sciences and Humanities Open Marketplace, which is like a, a catalog, an observatory of tools. You may want to consider uploading it to there and then this may be a way of generating visibility and interconnections as well. Thank you so much. And Clary has a link third party mm -hmm. at uh, Carnegie Mellon. Uh, the Top Bank project is a knowledge center event, and the uh, point of knowledge centers at Clary is to give expertise. So maybe you could get in touch with Brian McQueenie. Absolutely. Thank you. One comment to what you said, Sally you cannot upload things to the marketplace. Just add the metadata of your project. Yeah, uh, yeah I meant, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just in description, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Just, just yeah, yeah, yeah. The description of the tool yeah. in particular, yeah. And then people who have to say we're going to find uh, your, your project. Wonderful. I will pull all of you aside uh, <laughs> later and write things down. I wonder if uh, everybody else is just grabbing the coffee, but should we make a slow start yes, and then that, yeah. if people join us as well, that would be nice as well. So um, welcome back um, for the final session. Um, I'm very um, uh, honoured to be uh, chairing this panel, which is called The Role of Research Infrastructures as Enabler of Remote collaboration in digital humanities. And I think this has come up in right from our keynote speaker that feels like many hours ago now, um, all the way through, um, and we've been really interesting to see it. And as I was preparing for the panel, it was really interesting to think back, and Tom will remember this as well, um, just before um, just before D.H. Uh, Benelux uh, in uh, 2000, um, this was, we were getting ready to gear up and then uh, the pandemic happened. So we went to D.H. Benelux online. And this is one of the things that we've been doing. And uh, like many people have said, um, in, in Daria and Clarin, we've been doing quite a lot of work on trying to do remote things. So for example, the Daria annual event 2021 was online and we had more participation from more countries around the world. And then together, um, Clarin has also been doing quite a lot of things related to hybrid and online events, sharing of different resources and that sort of thing. So it's and um, we've been we've talked a lot about the hackathons as well. So this has been really great. So I'd like to now welcome uh, our panelists. So here on uh, my left, I think, uh, on the left of here, we have Magdalena Wunuk, um, who is um, based at the Institute of History of the Polish Academy of Sciences. And she works particularly in terms of open science. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, almost. I'm based in the Institute of Literary Research. That's what I thought sort of history. It was my PhD. Ah, that was your PhD. I can't read here because I was thinking you're based with Maciej. Uh, yes, the, I am. And this is the Digital Humanities Center. Uh, the Digital Humanities Center in, in Warsaw as well. But what you're working on is the coordinator of uh, operas in Poland uh, yeah. as well. But I'm sure you can introduce yourselves uh, um, as, as well. So Ulrika, um, Ulrika Henning. Um, who is Junior Academy Professor for Digital Humanities at the University of Rostock in Germany. And Tom Geldof, who is the Claria uh, Flanders Coordinator for KU Leuven Libraries, and he's an ancient historian by training. So we're delighted to have you all here today. So maybe you could each, if I just uh, go through each of the different panelists now, um, just to start, introduce yourself and uh, say a little bit about your research interests and also what has been your personal experience of working in remotely. So maybe I could start with Magdalena. Sure. Okay, so uh, hello everyone and I'm very happy that I can be here. So as uh, Sally mentioned before, I am working for the Digital Humanities Center in Warsaw. Uh, we are a part of the Institute of Literary Research, but actually my background is uh, in anthrop in cultural anthropology, ethnography, and history as well. Uh, so this is uh, who I am by training. Uh, but right now I am working as an open science officer, 
I am also the coordinator of the national node of Operas, a new infrastructure for, well, not that, not that new, but still newer than Daria, for instance, for open uh, communication in the humanities and in social sciences as well. So we are working remotely. Uh, we are collaborating remotely as Operas. But before I was also uh, engaged in the NGO sector in Warsaw, we've been doing some international projects and all of them were also remote. So the remote work is nothing new to me, but definitely uh, after COVID, it became a daily practice. So I'm very much used to it right now. I'm living not in Warsaw, although I am working in the Warsaw-based institution. I am living in the Czech Republic. Uh, so I have to be working remote also with my team uh, who I'm kind of leading right now. So. Yeah, so I think that would be enough, yeah? That, that's brilliant as well. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Rika. So, yes, so I'm uh, Rika Henny. I'm also very happy to be here and uh, looking forward to our discussion and panel. Um, I have a background in Latin American studies um, and through some courses of IT for humanists, uh, I quickly entered research projects in digital humanities and uh, worked in uh, projects from by different fields almost for 10 years. Um, uh, for example, papyrology, uh, Egyptology, so fields that I uh, did, did not study myself. Um, and the projects uh, were mainly about building up digital editions and archives. And through that, uh, um, almost more than 10 years ago, I joined a group of researchers uh, which have a virtual institute, the uh, Institute for documentology and scholarly editing. And for us, there was uh, always remote work um, because there were always um, working in different places in uh, Germany yeah. and beyond. Uh, and uh, I remember that we used Skype. <laughs> now we have switched to, to Zoom. And there, there was a second project um, which evolved through the TI mailing list uh, with um, researchers from Lisbon in Portugal, a digital scholarly edition project. Uh, which started remotely and uh, we are still working on this digital edition for more than eight years and now we have also met in person uh, but uh, it took uh, several years until we did so but it was a, a good experience of uh, being able to work also through meetings on Skype uh, and uh, I can only confirm what you say Martha, that um, there has been remote work before but now it has increased a lot and it also the way of deciding whether something is uh, being done remotely or not does not only depend on where people are uh, physically. Mm -hmm. uh, it's my impression. So it's it's there are other factors influencing uh, these these decisions. Brilliant. Thank you, Rika. Tom. Yeah, I can only relate to what my two colleagues already have mentioned. So also for me, uh, remote collaborations are nothing new. So now I work as a coordinator, as Sally mentioned, in our Claria Flanders project, which is a small regional scope. But of course, we're incorporated in this uh, European uh, Claria or Daria consortium in the Clarion uh, network as well. And myself as an ancient historian, uh, one of uh, the first projects I became involved in was the Pelagios network, which will also be more uh, detailed introduced on the panel on Wednesday so I'm doing an advertisement job here as well but uh, also there um, we have been collaborating with scholars from all across uh, the globe uh, set up uh, projects uh, organized conferences dealing with speakers from different time zones and that was already happening before COVID and I can also only confirm uh, what my two colleagues have mentioned since COVID we feel that there's an increase in these remote collaborations, mm -hmm. that colleagues are also more familiar with the technology, with the possibilities, maybe also with the challenges uh, they pose. And for myself, it has been quite a rewarding uh, situation in which um, an Erasmus Plus project I was involved in, and that is now still running, the ENCODE project uh, that was supposed to organize a couple of workshops and conferences, and then also collect the training material uh, as one of the outputs, 
has been moved almost entirely online, at least for the first uh, 18 months. So when we were writing the proposal, COVID didn't exist yet, and we were planning everything to happen on site, in person, mm -hmm. and then suddenly we had to, uh, yeah, rethink the original uh, proposal, and that happened quite well, I guess. Uh, so also there, I only have uh, much positive to say about uh, remote collaborations. No, that sounds really interesting. And you said you sort of said about mostly positive, but have any of you experienced these challenges of working remotely that uh, have uh, have been that af maybe after COVID that you you're glad to have left that behind? Have there been any particular challenges you faced that uh, prevented you from doing things? Maybe I can also start here. The, the main challenge I found, although there are um, solutions to overcome those issues, is um, the, the coordinating issue. So especially uh, working for uh, voluntary networks, because I'm also uh, a coordinator of uh, one of the Pelagios activities. I also uh, am still involved in uh, epigraphy.info, a network of uh, researchers working with inscriptions from antiquity, but also uh, from later periods. And there, I must admit that it, I found it hard to um, coordinate new events, to coordinate project proposals um, fully remotely. So maybe also you can relate to that, Sally, when we were uh, thinking about uh, merging Clarin and Daria together at the Flemish level. Uh, we wrote our almost entire proposal online via a collaborative Google Doc, but without the in-person meetings, I don't know whether we would have been able to come with a coherent, come up with a coherent proposal as we have now. So that might be, in my opinion, one of the, the main challenges. Face to face does make it easier. Yeah, please or I must say that in teaching, I prefer face to face, mm -hmm. and that's also what the university now. Uh, um, proposes to go back to fully uh, teaching in presence uh, because sometimes I feel that participating remotely there are different kinds of participants there are the active ones that ask a question right out to the microphone into the whole room and then there are others uh, which I also find totally okay that rather mm -hmm. listen as passive participants but in teaching I think it's really important to get to uh, in contact with the students because otherwise mm -hmm. they uh because i've i've gone through i started in 2021 in rostock as a junior professor so we started in that phase when it was switching depending on the situation of the pandemic uh, so i experienced both ways of working with the students and uh they they quickly uh yes um hide behind the screen somehow so so i feel that's more important than maybe in research projects um, i think this is a really interesting i i have a feeling that it's about choosing the right method let's call it like that depending on what you're trying to do so ulrika what you were just saying about for maybe teaching there are many positive um uh, aspects to in person now, Magdalena, I'd like to sort of move on to open science, um, <laughs> because I don't know, this is my personal experience, was that when we started doing a perhaps recording presentations, um, we started uploading things more proactively to Zenodo or other long platform uh, as like this, when we had to share everything remotely. So I just wondered, has um, remote participation provided any opportunities for open science? Well, there was certainly this proliferation mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, like information and also uh, loads of data on the internet. Mm -hmm. Also, this is kind of an open science, but mm -hmm. open science as just, you know, a lot of information you can find is not enough. You have mm -hmm. to be able actually to use it properly. So, well, I would definitely recommend like mm -hmm. Zotero, Zotero and Zenodo to start with, mm -hmm. but I'm not, I do not think that this is, you know, this remote work and open science, they always go like together. This, mm -hmm. For me, there are actually kind of two different mm -hmm. uh, ideas and two different topics, which 
kind of share technologies, but this is mm -hmm. a little bit something else, at least for me. For instance, in the remote work, I use mainly Google Docs, and I believe there are some other, you know, like tools, Confluence, Jira, any other you can use when you work with uh, pro programmers or in general IT teams. Mm -hmm. But this is something else than open science as an idea and it's something that you share your knowledge. Mm -hmm. However, as you mentioned, somehow it did this remote work kind of maybe strengthened open mm -hmm. science. So, but this is something I'm, I'm only, I'm only thinking about this right now. For instance, in Operas, we have launched lately this, the Go Triple platform. Mm -hmm. It is totally based on uh, an open science concept, but at the same time, there is this collaborative uh, element of it. So they are hoping that through Go, the Go Triple platform, some teams will emerge and new teams, people will find each other, find researchers they can relate to whom they couldn't find or had difficulties find without the Go Triple platform. I don't know, this is an experiment. We don't know if it will happen, but yeah, somehow they do go together. But for me, there are kind of two different topics, I guess. Two different topics yeah. and you need more in open science. Yeah. <laughs> I can study because yeah, please. Yeah, also yeah. with the ENCODE uh, project, we were one of the guinea pigs of the Go Tribal platform. So it was also my experience that maybe the two different topics uh, diverted a bit. Um, and in my opinion, um, having more of these remote uh, organizations, conferences, workshops, maybe improve the quality of the material that mm -hmm. was created specifically for these kind of events. So just speaking for myself, I know that I put a lot more effort into preparing an online or a hybrid uh, lecture, let's say, than when I would just do it in person, maybe improvise a bit more and having the slides as just something that strengthens what I'm saying. Whereas if I know that most people would be watching it either live at the event or maybe even afterwards when it would be recorded, I would make sure that the quality would remain the same, whether you would watch it uh, at the time of the lecture or afterwards. And then the last thing I think what we did with within the ENCODE project is also make sure that we didn't put these efforts in it for nothing. So we are reusing the material. Um, we have been using Go Tribal as a platform to also improve the discoverability to extend our network. And also the already mentioned uh, Daria platforms, Daria Campus and Daria Teach are already existing platforms in which we hope if we add material there that it will improve the findability uh, and also because the networks have already or the platforms have already uh, proven their value. And this is very interesting the platform question as well so I don't know any of you have you had challenges or opportunities about sharing data fairly we talk a lot about fair data but for men, for, during COVID, sort of many archives, libraries, museums were closed. So sometimes they opened up the collections even more. Um, how was that with Corpora? So did you, were all of the, the materials that you needed, were they available in platforms online or? Um, well, definitely, hmm. <laughs> definitely not, but at least not, for instance, uh, you know, the archives in Poland that I've been using to my PhD, they were closed and they are still closed. So it's kind of difficult to analyze them even right now. I would have to, you know, have this, I would have a, uh, I have to show them the project that I'm actually working for to, to get mm. to, to reach them and to get an access to them. So, yeah, but still, and then again, it definitely helped, yeah, because many, many things were uploaded. So, I guess that that depends on the discipline. Anybody in my case, it was sometimes an obstacle that whether the University of Rostock itself uh, opened up more tools for collaboration, like chat for all, all university members, team server, and things like that. Um, but there was uh, it was limited to university members, and we were so happy to have the tools. But then in the collaborative project, uh, it was, uh, for example, the chat is impossible to open for external uh, people. Mm -hmm. And there, it's of course we can use uh, Google Drive or something like that. But preference would be to use uh, uh, other types of uh, of tools. Uh, so their infrastructure can really help if it's not institution-based 
uh, to promote uh, remote projects from different institutions. Yeah, maybe one small comment about that. So uh, at my university uh, in Leuven, uh, they decided to create an entirely new uh, repository. It was based on the Dataverse uh, platform. Mm -hmm. So luckily we are mostly using the same standards and the platforms are interchangeable, but this can also be an obstacle, especially for an early career researcher who maybe doesn't know where to put out the uh, data set he or she has been working on. And I don't know whether this will increase the findability. Luckily then there are these uh, more um, superseding uh, platforms like the marketplaces where you can advertise mm -hmm. uh, data sets like this and then just point them to the direction where this is stored. So that's the ideal situation. I only don't know if we're already in that state where every possible data set that you are interested in can be found through these different uh, platforms. And I think this is exactly what Magdalena was referring back to, that, that putting it out there is, is only the first step. Yeah. Um, would you like to add anything at this stage? I was just thinking, you know, about, and then the other, other stuff that we, we are facing, for instance, in sociology, we have this problem with data which should be anonymized. Mm -hmm. So people can upload it to Google Docs, and they often do that in order to work remotely. But it's not actually, you know, the best way to do that. It's not safe. So, so definitely, there are a lot of things to be done in terms of uh, safety of the data we are we are sharing, and not all of them can be open. So that I think that's that we agree upon. So definitely, not all of them will be findable because not all, all of them will be open, and some kind of. But everyone will be able to use it just because we, I don't know, found it and would like to use it. So we still lack, I guess, an infrastructure. And even if there is one, like there are repositories in Poland uh, in terms of the social, I saw some kind of social uh, research data. Uh, people do not know about it. Mm -hmm. Institutions still would not implement them uh, successfully. So there is a lot to be done in terms of, at least in terms of fair data uh, in sociology, in the humanities as well, I guess. Interesting. And I wonder if how are the audience thinking, uh, so maybe not right now, but if you could start thinking of questions, it would be great to involve you in the question uh, in the conversation as well. So any thoughts now or I'll come back to you when uh, you've had a little chance to think. Right there. Let's uh, see, get those questions brewing. So now I'd like to come a bit more about on this sort of inclusion. Uh, sustainability and we've talked a lot about multilingual resources as well today so um, we're thinking now about early career researchers maybe less financially mobile uh, people people in the global south uh, Tom already mentioned uh, different time zones and obviously many people are here in Graz and we've traveled uh, we've got uh, colleagues from China over here we've traveled many thousands of kilometers to come here um, how and the other side of the coin is um, computing I mean zoom I'm sure zoom corporation has got many different servers running in order to and help us to communicate um, digitally, but that's not without an environmental cost as well. So I wondered what considerations have you got, and maybe we can start with Ulrika this time, to do with sort of inclusion, sustainability, uh, environmental issues? How, how do you think about these sort of challenges? Mm -hmm. I think in, in practice, in organizing research, uh, I spent more thoughts on the potential of including more people, mm -hmm. um, more than the environmental aspect, I must admit. Mm -hmm. But uh, and, and that's really, really uh, great potential, I think, because and I also feel that's caused by the pandemic that afterwards now uh, in my team, uh, whatever we organize, we always think in which mode are we going to open it up. Mm -hmm. And uh, most often we are opting for hybrid because we think it's, uh, we want everyone to get everyone on board. Uh, and of course, it's, uh, it's not so much more effort. It's a bit more of organizational and technical effort. Um, uh, but for, for example, we have organized a lecture series and for the whole semester, 
uh, half of the participants were there in the room and the other half online. So we, we would have really lost half of the people. Uh, and it was also mixed people from Rostock online and in the room and people from beyond Rostock uh, online. Um, but for the environmental aspect, uh, I think uh, it would be good to have studies analyzing how much mm -hmm. uh, energy is actually, uh, uh, how much does it cost to, to do the, the meetings, um, yes, to make such decisions. There is already a bit of data and a bit of uh, scholarship going on right now. And I think also within digital humanities, there is this, but I forgot to name, I can look it up afterwards, the, the greener uh, digital humanities uh, uh, collaborat collaborative uh, collaboration. Sorry. Um, myself, I was also interested uh, also within the scope of this Erasmus Plus project. So we, um, together with a colleague of mine uh, from Oslo University, We've actually looked uh, looked into what our digital uh, footprint would be, um, but it was very hard to find uh, trustworthy data. Let's say uh, some scholarship also dates back many years ago, and you, don't, you never know how uh, actual the data are. Um, then on the other side, I think if you would compare the the footprint of fifty participants coming from all over the world to one specific place. It will also always be higher, even if you do some very high performance computing on the spot or in your hybrid or uh, online events. Um, so I, I, I just have two thoughts. I don't have any solutions right now, except that you might want to try to convince your institution to look into uh, how they can uh, become more CO2 neutral, maybe invest in uh, green energy uh, sources, etc. But um, as an organizer or as a researcher, I just thought about the um, inclusion that mm -hmm. their uh, online or hybrid participation actually make, makes it possible uh, for, for many more scholars who are in a, well, maybe not the luxurious position we are in to participate in these events. Um, whereas you could also, also work with uh, bursaries, but then you of course have to find mm -hmm. Uh, a funding agency that is willing to uh, pay for these costs, but also as an organ or from the organizational perspective, the in-person's workshops always seem to be much more uh, rewarding also for the participants. Uh, so we did some surveys after uh, both our online mm -hmm. um, our online workshops and the in-person workshops we organized afterwards, and you saw the differences in both quality, but also in um, how the participants themselves rated it. So uh, it's just to my two cents. I mean, uh, two points to uh, I would like to add. Uh, one is that the decision to uh, do something hybrid or online also influences the decision about the language the event is held in. Mm -hmm. uh, that can change with the mode of, uh, of the event. Uh, and another point adding to that, uh, is um, that people who have family and children uh, also get the chance to pursue their careers uh, and it can help them uh, participate even if it would not be possible otherwise. So that's another good thing. Yeah, I agree. There are more pluses than minuses. And still, we have to think about more energy efficient way of uh, you know, producing energy. So I also believe that flying around uh, the globe is much worse than uh, connecting via Zoom uh, and much less inclusive. So yeah, we've also done a very creative design thinking workshop, which mm -hmm. was done totally remotely. And people were, were extremely mm -hmm. uh, grateful for that because otherwise they couldn't and wouldn't be able to participate anyway. So the fact that it was remote was a, for them, it was, uh, it was great. And they were very grateful. Maybe one great idea that I cannot um, mention here, uh, or I, I will mention it here because it's from our colleague, Mike Gestamon from Antwerp University, uh, back when the EADH conference would be organized in uh, somewhere in Siberia, if you probably remember. Mm, yes, the yes, university. yes. He had the idea for the um, green digital humanities community to um, 
all join one uh, train carriage and then make sure that the train carriage would have uh, an internet connection and organize a pre-conference workshop on the train riding to the, to the location of the conference. So unfortunately, a lot of things happened since not only COVID, but other things. Yes. Why, uh, but who knows, maybe at the next uh, EAD, DHO, uh, DH event, we can still try to organize this. That, that's an interesting memory, a collective memory, because yes. we're bringing it back. So any thoughts from either from our remote uh, audience um, or uh, in the room? Any thoughts or questions that you have uh, for the panel comments? Yes, please. Um, I'd be curious to hear more about um, any um, structures you've implemented for a healthy work-life balance. For example, um, any rules on when to work, when not to work, um, how often to communicate, or um, the time that is okay to pass until you answer um, a chat message whatsoever. Because I see a little bit, um, I mean, as much as I also see all the advantages uh, from a DEI perspective. I also see a little bit um, of the problem in maybe people not having um, much space at home, working from their kitchen tables, for, for example, um, as opposed to having an office. And um, yeah, I'm a little concerned with those boundaries between now it's time not to work anymore and to be mm -hmm. offline. And if, there, if this has been an open conversation, if you established um, rules in advance or maybe ran into problems on the way and then figured out solutions how and any experiences i'd be curious to hear more about mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to respond i may say something i guess uh well i think that in general in research we have trouble with this work-life balance mm -hmm. yeah, so uh, <laughs> so it, it would be probably useful to think it through uh either you are working remotely or not but well, we actually, uh, since I'm not a researcher right now, not, not par excellence researcher, I'm working as an officer, so we have this, you know, schedule time, schedule time of uh, when I should be at work. So it's like nine to nine to five or, there, or eight to 16. So then uh, it is at least, I believe it is very important to keep in mind that this is the time when you are working, right? just as you would have, you would be working when you were in the office. So that's this, this is what I am doing. But also, what helps me is uh, to trying to keep the meetings in one half of the day and the other half of the day to leave for exact work, like a very in-depth work. So people often forget about it that then they have you know like meetings at nine then at uh, 12 then at three so the whole day goes and you just are zooming and zooming and zooming all the time so it is very important to set the boundaries at the very beginning of the project and for instance agree upon the fact that okay we are meeting only in the mornings or our other way around we are meeting only in the afternoons when we are not so we are already a little bit tired so the meetings would not be that uh, you know exhausting for us uh, like in the, but maybe not, the, we will be a little bit exhausted. So the, the first hours of work would be more productive if we do something more in depth. So these are all the things that you can agree upon in the team. And it is very important to, to do that beforehand, before the start, yeah, when the, when the project is kicked off. This is what we are trying to do at least. Brilliant. And I would recommend it. Thank you. Yeah. Any further comments? Yeah, maybe also not a solution, but a further question. This is, of course, more difficult if you're working in uh, in an international network, for example, the, the Pelagios network. So we have uh, board members from all across the world, uh, from Australia to the United States. And unfortunately, there's not one golden hour in which you can always uh, place the, or schedule the meetings. Uh, but we have come up with a kind of in-between solution, I would say. So every uh, two months, there is an in-person or a Zoom meeting, uh, but uh, a face-to-face -face meeting, uh, whereas every other month, uh, the meeting is uh, taking place asynchronously. So the, uh, the, the agenda is put online and uh, every member gets one week to add any comments, any questions, etc. And everyone can just reply to it whenever... Uh, they find the time. Um, of course, this also sometimes still um, creates conflicts, conflicts of agenda, conflicts of um, work-life balance. Um, but on the other hand, we don't expect from board members to attend all meetings. 
and we keep the reports in a repository so that every time when someone wants to take a holiday, they can and they can still come back to one of the previous uh, meeting reports uh, if necessary. I think that's very interesting. Enrico, would you yes. like to add something? Uh, thank you for the question. I think it's a very important uh, issue and that awareness for that is uh, really important. Um, as I feel that uh, pressure has also been more uh, with the online meetings mm -hmm. to have more meetings one after the other and not calculating in the breaks that that one would have if one goes from one place to another physically. Yes, yes. Um, and so maybe one has to recover that and get it back uh, planning also breaks uh, in all uh, also in the remote work. Um, and uh, now, now I will take that up in my team the topic because I, uh, uh, I see I haven't done that in general uh, in the team. So we we do it quite individually. I try to respect when uh, the members of the team are working because they uh, they don't all have full time jobs. So some have fifty percent, and then I try to really respect. Those days uh, are the days they're working on, and I will not write a chat message on the other days. Uh, but maybe it would be a good thing to discuss it with them also, and that uh, I have, haven't done that yet. So thank you. Please, and then yes. there's somebody in the chat as yes, well. Sir, so yes. we go for first. Um, so, class, yes. would you like to open your mic and uh, maybe well, share your question yeah. with the rest of us? This is maybe not a comment or question that concerns remote collaboration as such, but it, it might be a consequence of working in different uh, settings with different standards and practices. And, and I was thinking about the potential conflict that can appear when, when you have expectations of working in an open science environment. It could be from, from funders, it could be from, from your own university. And sometimes this may clash a little bit with with the um, routines for ethics vetting we, we have experienced this and there seems to be different standards within universities within the same country Is, do you have any thoughts about this or have you experienced this thank you class uh, anybody in the panel So maybe you could, I mean, maybe you could give, do you have a particular example that you could help us to start the conversation class? Well, it could be that, that there are expectations of sharing data sets uh, as in an open science um, environment, that there is, there is um, an agreement that you should do that. And that might be in conflict with local, uh, local routines, local rules on, on ethics which you need to apply for on a local level in order to proceed with the project. Um, and there's, there's been some complications, not in this particular project that I presented today, but in other projects where we've had, we have had uh, the project in one university and they have been sort of the PI and, and uh, people in other universities have experienced other rules other practice in terms of this and then when you do the ethics application especially if you have you have a phd student involved you might come up with problems yes if there's different sort of conflicting maybe or slightly conflicting ethical policies between the universities right, right. and also between different countries as an example yes Yes. Does anybody have some experience? That? Not personal experience because, well, I'm an ancient historian, so for me, ethics is <laughs> not um, not always uh, put first in, in proposals, let's say, or we're dealing with uh, personal data from people that are already dead for 2000 years. But um, on a serious note, uh, yeah, at the Flemish level, we have the uh, Flemish Research Data Network that it has just started off, let's say, having these kind of conversations about how we can overcome these issues. And um, a couple of months ago, they organized their first uh, network meeting, global network meeting in, in Flanders with different stakeholders. And we had uh, a couple of round tables, also small panels in which uh, colleague researchers could um, yeah, just put these kind of issues on the table. 
And I do remember that a lot of colleagues, um, especially working in the university hospital, uh, regularly dealt with these kind of issues mm -hmm. because for them, they have a much more strict uh, ethical policy on uh, data from their patients. And it's not just uh, acceptable to anonymize them and then share them uh, within the regular university uh, repositories. Um, so I think, yeah, this is a, probably a discussion that also will need some mm -hmm. more thinking, some more input from multiple stakeholders. Um, but I guess this is also probably something if you are going to deal with these issues and you already know this on beforehand that you try to um, try to mention this in your proposal and maybe already have the discussion with, uh, with experts uh, from your network. And maybe this is also thinking about open science practices, ethical and legal literacy as part mm -hmm. of open science, perhaps. I don't know yeah, if you have yeah, any but thoughts. It, it is, but mm. you know, there are a lot of questions behind it. And I don't have a good example for that. But again, as my background is also social sciences, there are a lot of issues regarding data that sociologists and general social, social, social researchers are collecting. For instance, I'm collaborating with the Center of Migration Research at the University of Warsaw. As far as I know, uh, they often uh, interview the same people who have been already interviewed, mostly because of mm. the fact that there are some ethical issues standing behind. So that they prefer to do their own interview with their own consent than to use the data the other colleagues mm. are, are having. Or, and I'm not saying only about the Center of Migration Research because they're collaborating with many other institutions of this kind uh, from other countries. But then, then they are feeling already that, okay, we have to do something about it, that everyone has a lot of data on their own computers and they are so afraid to share it that they just don't do it, but they prefer to do the work over and over again, although it's, it's kind of uh, repetitive. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, yeah, what can I say? But I also was thinking about other issues because in general, like for example, publications, there also might be some conflict uh, of interest in terms of where to publish. Uh, why in this or other journal, uh, some universities, as far as I know, they they have different lists of uh, journals that they would prefer the authors to publish in. So these are those conflicts as well that might come up when you collaborate uh, in different uh, in, yeah, in international teams. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think uh, Daria had a question. I just have a quick response uh, to this topic and a completely different question for the panelists. Um, uh, I think that the, the easy working uh, solution for this would be just to agree with the strictest possible alternative within the consortium, and then this should automatically be good enough for the less strict partners. Um, but also, you know, this is part of a long process where you go towards standardization as much as possible, because only in those collaborative settings do you identify those issues and try to come across uh, with better solutions like we have done with, you know, the Euro and the mobile phone use all over Europe, we can still maybe slowly contribute to that. What I wanted to ask was uh, in remote collaboration, how I think that online meetings and all those uh, the technologies that you have mentioned, they work with uh, you know, regular work and uh, how you check in, how you give feedback or uh, summarize to the entire team. But how do you deal with uh, dealing dealing with problems? How do you mm -hmm. uh, identify that problems do exist in a research team, in a project team? And how do you solve them? That I personally find very difficult. Interesting question. Does anybody have any thoughts on that one? How do you even identify yeah, the before it's too late? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Difficult one. Yeah. I think the best practice that uh, the keynotes uh, shared this morning, right? Uh, this uh, chat of instant feedback and instant uh, communication with yeah, the project real, team. Work in real time. Work in real time. That's, I like that, yes. That's what we missed in upskills in our project, probably. <laughs> we could have uh, mm -hmm. maybe prevented more problems and issues. Maybe, but as just uh, the the workflow we implemented in our in our Erasmus Plus project, we assigned clear roles from the beginning of the project uh, also 
with in mind that possible issues would arise in the course of the project and that we would want to uh, quickly identify them and, and, and solve them as, as swiftly as possible. So what we did identify was also the role of um, a kind of looking for the, the right term um, mediator, maybe not the, the right term, Super like nicer? a no more like a trust, a person of trust. So mm -hmm. someone who was yeah. not um, per se part of the project, but where uh, project partners could um, send any possible issues in mm -hmm. all kinds of uh, domains to. Um, and at one point we had uh, we had a, a very urgent problem, namely that uh, a partner in the project uh, found a new job. Uh, so it goes in academia and uh, we couldn't, or the university couldn't find an immediate replacement for his uh, specific profile. So at that point, all of the partners together also with the departing partner had to uh, rewrite the original proposal and also make sure that not all of the tasks became a burden for the other uh, project partners that were already overwhelmed. So there uh, also this mediator played uh, an instrumental role. Uh, and, and in the end, we actually, I found very quickly in less than three months, came up with a new proposal that also had to be signed by all the project partners, institutions. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, I think, maybe one way to, uh, well, to at least from the beginning of the project already um, try to, to react to such uh, potential problems. So I think we're already, it's gone quickly. We're already coming to the end of time, but maybe we could finish up with, so, We've talked a lot about infrastructure, so we've got operas, we've got Clarin, we've got Daria. What kind of role do you see as infrastructures could play in facilitating either remote or, you know, sort of remote hybrid online? How can we help in this process? Uh, does anybody have any thoughts on what kind of role should infrastructures have in this uh, new environment. Any thoughts about that? Well, I think maybe it goes back to some point uh, I said earlier that uh, uh, make uh, make offers for um, uh, technical solutions that are not institution based. Uh, maybe not everyone will need them, but mm -hmm. to include uh, people that uh, work independently or teams that need a common basis also. And then also regarding the research data management and open science point, uh, I think infrastructures can play also an important role in handling the difficult cases because the, the obvious and, and uh, um, case is everything can be open and that's the easy case but we talked about personal rights issues copyright issues mm. uh, not to prevent those data from being stored only on local computers to to also work on solutions uh, for such such data sets um, uh, so that um, maybe the goal must not always be completely open data but a better management of data mm -hmm. Maybe the metadata can still be published so yes. people find it, even if it's not Absolutely. open. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to say that an example that, for instance, we are talking with the Clarin in Poland, uh, because they got they started started to uh, get you know, questions uh, regarding copyright issues. They have those mm -hmm. literary corpuses. And okay, uh, the researchers are kind of, uh, they're not sure how they can use it after when in terms of reusing uh, the data. And they came to us because we are doing the open science and they can ask the question, okay, so we are actually getting lost with all of these copyright mm -hmm. issues. Can we somehow collaborate on this? Because I, I'm afraid we, we will get lost finally. So th this is exactly what you're asking. I'm not saying that we have the solution, but at least we started to talk about it because, you know, this. Those copyright issues, they are not only regarding the publications, uh, scholarly publications, but also the things that we are using uh, as scholars. So, yeah, so I think collaboration and the, then again, <laughs> the collaboration, that's the first thing. And the other, we I think that infrastructures should also think about somehow this background technology, not mm. on, only what the aim is of a new technology for the researchers or for other, other people, uh, you know, for other 
stakeholders in academia, but also how it is going to be operated afterwards, what is going to happen uh, around it afterwards, because this is the case with uh, this client. Okay, we build the corpuses, we build the tools, but then again, we don't know on, on what basis, on what legal mm -hmm. basis we can be using it. We don't have clear rules about it. So yeah, so this is also, yeah, we have to think it through all of it. Yes, the longer term. Yes. yes. Thank yeah, you. I, I might be biased here as well because I'm directly part of in, in or part of some of these consortia. But to me also as well, it brings together a lot of expertise. Uh, the networks, uh, the European consortia. There are already some very good examples of collaborations. Um, they can also amplify already existing work. Uh, there can be a tool, a service. Um, so improve the discoverability, and I think we're only at, at the start or the beginning of this journey with the uh, European Open Science Clouds. Um, and yeah, I think also, again, the collaborative X uh, part, in my opinion at least, um, proves the value of these networks. So not only organizing this kind of events, but also um, making sure that, for example, something uh, Juliana and Vicky, we're also um, uh, part of the organization of uh, an event at uh, Daria annual event in which we brought together DH uh, master program coordinators, uh, internship coordinators, program directors, and uh, industry stakeholders to think about how we can more clearly uh, define the profile of such uh, graduates, but also um, how, uh, for example, uh, we might um, get more interns into um, yeah, the industry. So that's also, I think, um, a part where these research infrastructures can play an instrumental role in. But I think a lot of the examples have already been mentioned here throughout the day. And I think also in the rest of the program, uh, they are uh, omnipresent. So. I think this is really lovely that, uh, and I think <laughs> I think outside is telling us something, but I think this is really lovely that we came to this about remote and I take it we've moved towards the actually important part is the collaboration. So with this, I would like to thank the collaboration of our panelists. Thank you very much.